Sounds awesome. I'm psyched. All right. Ready? <clears throat> Let's do it. Okay. I think we should start with an introduction of Matt. So, Will, you, we've done a whole podcast, so people know who you are. Matt, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background and your connection to Will and, and how this all fits together? Yeah, sure. Uh, I lifelong athlete, uh, always been a big science nerd and athlete of all things. So I've played pretty much every sport under the sun at some point or another, got to college, studied kinesiology. So that's what my degree is in from the university of Maryland. And that's where I found rock climbing too. uh, too many years of soccer and track kind of had me burnt out and parts feeling older than maybe they ought to at 18, 19 years old. And one day I was studying looked out my window and was just over studying and saw this big rickety wooden thing behind the gym at university of Maryland and people rock climbing on. It. And I was like, that looks better than what I'm doing right now. So I'm going to go try that ditch studying, went and climbed, <laughs> met a bunch of really nice people and had a ball and then really haven't looked back 15 years later. Wow. Um, cool. so that was kind of how I found rock climbing. And then two years later, um, I started setting and coaching part-time at, the gym formerly known as earth treks uh or that's how i like to think of it not that anything against movement but it's just with a different vibe then uh and there was this other dude will anglin coaching at one of the like three earth trek gym locations there and we hit it off he was like a lot better at rock climbing and still is than me uh and we were just coming at the sport from really different angles. And I thought that that was really interesting. So I had a lot to learn from him. It also just so happened that, uh, Will's now wife and I were close friends and had a lot of friends in common in college as well. So it was like a easy hang a lot of times, pretty convenient. Um, yeah, I think we were just coming at the sport from really different angles. And then I coached at the earth tracks gym for almost 10 years, I think eight and a half, nine years. Um, before my wife and I moved out to Seattle where I started coaching for the vertical world climbing team, uh, with Tyson Shaney and a bunch of other really amazing coaches and athletes out there did that for four years or change maybe. And then my wife and I moved to Charleston, South Carolina, where we're at now, where I run my own climbing Jones fitness and performance.com is where you can find me, <laughs> uh, where it's just an online training support system for athletes. Most of my clients are climbers, but I do coach athletes in other sports as well. Okay. Yeah. Right on. Perfect. And yeah, I will have probably talked about this in the intro a little bit, but I want to touch on why we're doing this, what we're trying to accomplish here. Um, Will, you and I had a conversation in our previous episode, mostly about, well, we talked about tons of things, but as far as training goes, we gave a lot of caveats. We talked about um, some of the trends you've noticed and stuff. But, you know, just reminded people it's, it's really hard to be prescriptive on a podcast because you, it's really about discovering your own path and climbing and, and leaning into actual rock climbing skills. Um, but we both left that conversation feeling like, ah, we wish we could give people something a little bit more tangible because lots of people were going to be, or, you know, listen to that and had questions and they want to know, of course, the burning questions for people is always like, what do I actually do? You know, if I'm a really good rock climber and I'm weak. Uh, maybe they identify with you, Will. Um, what do I do? Or, you know, if, I'm, if I've am if i spent all my time in the gym and I know that I'm pretty strong but don't have those climbing skills, what do I do? So that's what we're trying to help with in this conversation. You guys are the masterminds behind this, qu- the, behind this conversation or this episode. I'm just the guide here. Um, let's start with who is this for? Who is this episode for? Who are we trying to help? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think... Um, a lot of what we're trying to do here is help like identify areas of focus rather than give very specific things to do, um, try and help people understand what, uh, what some helpful goals might be. Um, and as far as who, who this is for, um, kind of in, in Matt and I's history of, of coaching and working with athletes, we've often found that people fall kind of towards one end of the spectrum or another where it's uh, like you said, a climber who feels like they're really strong, but maybe uh, doesn't feel like they're 
performance matches up to the strength level that they have, or something a little bit more on the opposite side where a uh, climber feels like they're, you know, having relatively good performance, but their strength just seems to really be lagging behind. Um, and so we've tried to build out a bit of a, a guide for folks who fall in one of those two categories and looking at progression between what does a beginner climber look like and what does an intermediate climber look like and then what does an advanced climber look like and how do we move from one of those things to the next yeah so how do each of those two types of climbers what should they do or what should they focus on at each of those skill levels so whether they're kind of newer in their climbing or they've been doing it for a few years or they've been doing it for a lot of years um what should we talk about next should we talk about um what makes up kind of kind of broadly speaking we'll get more into the specifics as we go through each category but what broadly speaking um are you talking about or, or how are you defining beginner intermediate and advanced do you want to touch on that a little bit before we dive further in yeah matt you want to tackle that sure uh i think you know this is a tricky one because you can what will and i talked about this not long ago that no matter where you're at in your progression as a rock climber you are a beginner and intermediate and advanced and maybe elite in a bunch of different things all at the same time so I, let me just answer your question maybe with like a disclaimer first that like we're creating a lot of binary and dichotomy things here like you are this thing or you're at one end of the spectrum or the other we're really it's it's not ever that we're just using those as means to discuss this kind of stuff um i see i think we, will and i have both seen a lot of this climbers overly identify with i am this kind of a climber i like crimps or i'm good at overhang or i'm strong not good or whatever it might be and they kind of pigeonhole themselves and it really uh it, it it deters them from branching outside their comfort zone and progressing in ways that they could otherwise if they didn't put that label on themselves so uh i'm going to say a lot of things that we're just using as means to communicate but please don't uh feel like you're you are this thing and then you're that thing forever because mm -hmm. that's not helpful for anybody um but to actually answer your question how are we defining these things so real basically uh a beginner climber we're putting is somewhere capping out in that like v4 511 plus range uh, we'll go into a lot more detail about like what characteristics go into that climber. I think that's a lot more important than the V grades that we're talking about here. Intermediate climber, it's probably somewhere in that like V5 to V9 range and then up to easy 13s on rope. Advanced climber, kind of anything north of those numbers. Um, there's also kind of a, a range of time of your climbing career that falls within each one of those two. But again, you can kind of be bouncing between those things, whether it be beginner, intermediate, advanced, outside of your climbing career duration based on your capabilities of where you're at at a given moment. Yeah. Yeah, totally. So if you spend all your time climbing on the moon board, you might be advanced at that style and you might be an intermediate or even beginner when it comes to technical granite face climbing or slab or cracks or something like that. Like maybe you want to eventually go do the free rider and, and um, you might identify with some of those um, other categories as far as things you should focus on for building that skill set. Totally. Cool. Yeah. Okay. All right. So um, I think we should just dive in here in a second. I just want to remind people we're going through six archetypes. So beginner, uh, good, not strong will be one type of person and then strong, not good, very oversimplified, but this is just guidelines to help you out. We're going to do that for beginner and then those two things for intermediate and then those two things for advanced. And then within each of those, we'll hit on three key things. I'll let these guys talk about that in a second, but just want to let you guys know that I always do timestamps for these episodes. Um, they're called nuggets. You can find that in your podcast app by scrolling down or in the show notes. Um, and I will really clearly break out all of these six different types. So if you want to go back and revisit one of these sections that you identify with, especially strongly, um, you can go find that in the timestamps and go right back to that section. All right. Um, awesome. let's, let's dive into beginner unless there's anything else we need to cover before we jump in. 
Yeah, I think there's, I, I want to cover a few kind of general ideas oh, that we're going to be touching on multiple times. It's, it's all good. So, <laughs> so just a few things that we're going to, we're going to come back to multiple times as we hit these different, uh, like ability levels or types of climber, just so we have uh, a common understanding about some of these core themes. So, um, one of the, one of the most important ones I think is understanding the relation of skill and strength. And we're going to talk about it as a spectrum in a lot of ways, uh, as we move through these, you know, different climbers and ability levels, but it's really more of like a feedback loop. Strength is going to magnify your ability to perform skills and increasing your skill level is going to allow you to get more out of your strength. And so there's this constant feedback loop happening between your skill and your strength. And there's, they're not really two super separate things. Um, and that interplay is really important. Um, so you can, this loop can work in a kind of a positive way or a negative way. And so the, the first way I put it is kind of the positive way where, yeah, skill is going to magnify your strength and strength is going to magnify your skill. But at the same time, strength can mask a lack of skill and skill can mask a lack of strength. Mm. Um, and this is this interesting relationship between strength and skill is something that we're going to kind of constantly be touching on as we're discussing the rest of these points. Very good. Uh, to add on to that, sorry, can you hear this animal going crazy in the background here? Is this okay? No, Zoom's, Zoom's oh, blocking it out for us. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks, Zoom. <laughs> good so, job, Zoom. Uh, yeah. Another thing we'll come back to a bunch here is this concept of the four stages of competence. If you are a teacher or a coach or you've been exposed to like the learning process in any endeavor, you've maybe heard these things. So the four stages real quick are unconscious incompetence, which is uh, aka ignorance. You don't know what you don't know. You're so fresh that everything is new. And it's like that time you walk into the climbing gym and the first time you see somebody do anything, it completely blows your mind because you didn't know that was possible until 30 seconds ago. Second stage is conscious incompetence. After you see somebody blow your mind, you are now aware that that is an option that can happen in the world of climbing. So that's really important, right? Like when you see something happen or you're exposed to something for the first time, it kind of opens up a whole new world of possibilities for you. Third stage, conscious and conscious competence, which is learning. That's what we call like drill work and skill work in climbing, right? Like you're aware that all this stuff exists and now you're doing something on purpose to try to acquire that stuff. Fourth stage is unconscious competence or mastery. And this is what we kind of casually refer to as flow state where you're in the moment, you kind of have all these basic skills super dialed. So you don't need to be able to have seen them in this specific scenario, uh, but you know them so well that you can kind of apply them uh, you can improvise a lot more and things just happen. Mm. Uh, and this, it's one of those things you kind of know it when you see it, when somebody does it. And when you feel it, you, you hear this a lot. Uh, hey, so-and-so V27 boulder, you just flashed this super hard boulder. How did it feel? Yeah, I don't know, man. I don't really know what happened. And then I did this thing. And next thing I knew, I was on, on top of the boulder. There's a lot of unconscious stuff happening there. And that's what that mastery feels like. Um, Autopilot. Another thing we're going to, oh, yes, exactly. Um, next thing, this is a, a, a hill I die on. Uh, <laughs> things we use in climbing gyms are tools. Tools can be used in a whole bunch of different ways. And both Will and I are, have been guilty of this ourselves. I think maybe every rock climber has been guilty of this at some point or another, of misusing a tool. So I'll throw myself under the bus here and use myself as an example where early in my climbing career, I saw some YouTube video of Paul Robinson doing a hangboard workout. I believe he was in a boot, if memory serves correct. So I think he was injured. Uh, it was maybe less of a hangboard workout and more doing lots of pull-ups on bad edges on a hangboard. I think by the end of the like 12-minute video, he had done 
hundred and change pull ups on ten pull ups here, ten pull ups here, ten pull ups in a bunch of different ways. And being like eighteen months into my climbing career, psych was overflowing, and I was like, sick. If Paul Robinson's doing that, I should do that too. And started doing it. And he was doing it every day because he could not do anything else. He was in a boot. Though that workout did not represent the same thing to both of us, mm. right? Like to Paul, what that was of like, cool, let's just keep up some like base fitness pulling and finger strength. To me, I was doing a max effort day, five days a week now, which maybe like I was fine. I didn't get hurt, got lucky, right? But <laughs> uh was it the best thing i could have done for my climbing at that point in time probably not uh so we'll kind of use as we go forward like some of the best ways you can use the tools that are available to you based on where you're at in your progression of climbing makes sense yeah, that's yeah. great will anything to add um i guess just one last point before we jump in to the to the kind of the first block, uh, just this concept that if if you're very untrained and if you you've not done anything really, then pretty much anything you do is going to work. But the further you go along, the less and less that's going to be true. And so that's another kind of important point to what Matt's saying with the use of these different tools and potential misuse. Uh, the way that you would utilize something early in a climbing career might not be exactly the same way that you would utilize it later on. Um, I think that's going to be kind of an important concept as well. Mm -hmm. I think, I think every climber underappreciates that until they really learn it firsthand. You know, it's like, cause you do something and it works and you're like, oh, that was the secret sauce. Or you see someone else do something and it works for them. And you're like, that's the secret sauce over there. Um, but uh, yeah, it took me a long time to learn that. It, it took it took going through different seasons where I tried things that had worked in the past and they didn't work again, you know, where I was like, oh, I'm a different climber now. I need different things. I have different goals. Like that makes sense. But I had to kind of learn it the hard way. Hopefully other people don't have to. Maybe they're smarter than me. Okay. Do you remember? <laughs> and even the... Like, I was going to say, I feel like to me, everybody remembers their first plateau that mm. they hit as a rock climber, like the first time doing anything stops working. Do you, mm. do you remember yours, Steven? Ooh, um, uh, that's a really good question. I mean, it probably, probably kind of maxing out what I could do in Leavenworth. Um, you know, having come from a background of like climbing a lot in a gym as my primary training, but in a very old, uh, old school gym that was that had no overhangs basically it was all like very vertical very slippery tiny little holds and stuff so i was getting good at like dancey kind of balancey stuff that ended up serving me pretty well at smith um and then i was climbing like featurey thuggy squeezy things in leavenworth and just kind of missing everything in between so anytime there was a steeper climb with a bad hold I just had no chance. I couldn't, I couldn't just pull on stuff. I had no background in like board climbing or, you know, there was, there was no, I'd never climbed on a 45 period, like ever. Um, so I kind of worked my way up through the squeezy things I could do and then just hit like a really hard wall because, you know, I did my first V10 or something five years into climbing, but I was actually like a V7 climber as far as like being well-rounded. So I had to take a bunch of step backs, st bunch of steps back, and um, and like really backfill a lot of what was missing in the middle, which for me was was mostly like um, finger strength, but specifically like decent edge, lots of weight on your hands. I was used to being able to take a lot of weight off with either heel hooks and and squeezing on the compression stuff, or by like being you know balancey and, and kind of dance like on the more vertical stuff yeah it's a great example i think you actually uh said something that i think is really beneficial to pull out here as we dive into this of backfilling your skill set i think our goal here uh will and i is to help people identify things before you're way past them so that you don't have to go backwards mm. so like okay cool you're kind of feeling your progression stall for whatever reason, we'll dive into those, but here's what you can do to 
not only identify what it is that you're missing, but address how to overcome those uh, slowings of progression so that you don't have to be bashing your head against the wall for X amount of months or years and then go back and backfill stuff. So I think that's maybe part of our goal here is to help you identify that stuff ahead of time. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's, uh, right. let's jump in. Let's jump yep. in. Okay. So category number one, <laughs> beginner, um, do we need to, do we need to talk about anything else before we dive into strong, but not good? Uh, I think just kind of generally laying out what, what we're, what we mean by beginner climber in a little bit more detail, kind of okay. taking it, uh, a little bit more nuanced than like Matt said, just kind of the V grade. Generally speaking, this is, you know, this is just a new climber. Um, anyone who has never really done it before. And the, the first thing that I think is really important for beginner climbers coming out of that, like unconscious incompetence is gaining that initial awareness. And a lot of that comes from just watching people because it's, it's tough to generate if, if you have no experience. Um, and so something that I, I like to remind new climbers is watch other people and try and describe what it is that you're seeing them do. I find that to be a pretty helpful exercise. Um, and then if you know, you're in a position to try and replicate it, to take that a step further, that's a really great way to kind of begin to learn how to climb. Um, but for the beginner climber, there's also a certain level of general physical preparedness. That's also super important. Um, Matt and I have taken to calling this meat suit competence, <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. which is just kind of being comfortable in your body. I mean, climbing is, is, is a pretty strange thing to ask your body to do. And there aren't a ton of other things other than climbing, uh, like coming from other sports that might really prepare you for what it is you're, you're about to put yourself through. Um, and so that's, those are things that I think are, are pretty common in the beginner climber. And then we're kind of splitting it between this strong, not good and good, not strong. Um, I think the, uh, something that's been really helpful for me in over the years, just having Matt as somebody who I can work with and also discuss things and uh, try and come to answers for some of this is we're kind of at opposite ends of the spectrum, or at least that's been our experience in climbing. And so, um, you know, talking with Matt, he can really uh, shed more light on the strong, not good. And I'm more kind of the good, not strong. And so I'll, I'll leave it to, to Matt to, to take us through this first section of the, the good, not strong for the beginner climber. Yeah. I think it, it's Sorry, strong, illustrative. Not our, set up. Yeah. Strong, strong not good. Beginner, strong, <laughs> strong not, good. not good. Here we go. Yeah. So I think, uh, like Will said, this was just representative of how we both kind of our initial uh, relationship with the sport where I came from a sports background of kind of doing everything under the sun and then kind of right before getting into climbing a big emphasis on like calisthenics and gymnastics strength kind of stuff. So upon finding climbing, my ability to campus and project were not that far apart from one another from a V grade <laughs> perspective. Uh, so it didn't really compute to me how maybe like the more string bean shaped climbers in the gym were just cruising stuff that I couldn't even touch. Mm. Uh, so again, speaking from experience, things that the, if, if this feeling at all resonates to you, here are some things you might also feel. You get stuck not being able to identify what it is that other people are doing, right? Like we've all seen that or felt that thing when a teen kid slithers up your proj and they are nothing but skin and bones. Just... There, there's not a muscle to be spoken of and it's probably maybe even a steep climb. So this like, uh, your brain just doesn't compute how somebody could be doing this without the tools that you have available to you. We, Will and I have taken to calling this person the hammer. 
you are a hammer. So everything looks like a nail to you. And even though a boulder might be representative of a screw, maybe there's some like really technique like things that it's requiring of you, you still are going to try to smash the screw in. It might go in if you're lucky, but that's not how the screw is designed to be. If you hit it hard <laughs> enough, right? Like, but you got to really wall <laughs> that screw for it to go in. And like, if you're lucky, the screw goes in and doesn't break. And if you're lucky, the hammer also doesn't get messed up along the way, which regardless of what breaks and what doesn't, this is not the way to put a screw in the wall. We can all agree with that. So I think the the gist here is that you, you need to be able to recognize and acknowledge that not everything is a nail and that you need to be able to find ways to diversify the tools that you have. Hammer is still a valuable tool and will continue to be forever. So keep it, cultivate it. You don't need, you don't need to not work on your hammer anymore, but you need to be able to start recognizing when it's time to start using another tool. And if you don't have it, how to build it. Mm. So I think that's like the big take home for this strong, not good person. And that kind of plays into the meat suit competence role uh, issue that Will was talking about that you might be really good at being a hammer. And then somebody can say like, hey, this boulder doesn't require you to be really strong. You have to do this other thing. While that may make sense to you, you may not know how to make your body do that thing yet. And it's probably not because you're not strong enough. There's a lot more finesse and subtlety that needs to go into your practice here. And that's a really tough thing to learn for somebody who's maybe found a lot of success through just smashing harder over the years. Um, And I I think that's what makes it tough is because you're, when you're really strong and you're getting started in climbing, you're able to use that strength to be successful. And so it's tough to hear somebody who's like, hey, like maybe try to do this problem this way or solve this move this way. And you're like, well, why would I do that? I can just jump and grab that thing, or I could just campus the move. Um, And I think that's one of the the first major hurdles for a new climber is you kind of get stuck solving problems in one way because you're being successful. And if you, if you don't, you know, the earlier you can, can open your mind to other solutions the less you're going to have to do that kind of backfilling where you get, you, you push that strength really far, but eventually it's going, you're going to run into a wall where that's not going to solve your problems anymore. And it can be tough to go, to go backwards and have to, to build that technical competence when realistically you could do it all at the same time starting off. Yeah, I, I think uh, I'll, I'll use a fun case study that Will and I had back in the day. Uh, our our buddy Cole Hinga, who was a junior Olympics caliber gymnast, just a really incredible. He was the hammeriest hammer I've ever seen in my <laughs> whole life. Uh, so he came to us. His older sister uh, climbed pretty regularly at the gym. Cole was kind of burnt out on gymnastics world and just kind of said to us, like, hey, can I try out for climbing team? And we both said, like, no tryout necessary. Please just come join us next week. It would be really (laughs) awesome to have you. Uh, So Cole was already, like, 17 years old, 170-something pounds, and 0% body fat. So he could campus V9, but not climb V5, V6 on a, like, let alone slab. He couldn't do it on a flat wall. So the challenge Will and I kind of set for ourselves without – telling Cole was, can we make Cole tired enough through a practice that we take away his strength from him as a problem solving tool that he's forced to do something else because he's so pooped. Unfortunately, Cole was in much better shape than we thought he was. (laughs) So (laughs) mixed, mixed results there. He like, by the end of a two hour practice, he could still kind of crank out five, one arms whenever he wanted to. So it worked a little bit, but I think the point was a good one that like, We are trying to take away the way that he has problem solved everything as an athlete for 17 years. And in doing so, forced him to try to come up with ways to get stuff done that he was not accustomed to doing. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think if you're like a coach out there listening, and you probably can identify a few of these hammers on your team as well. 
that encouraging them to like, we, we've all coached that kid who's like, Hey, you know, you should do it this way. And they're like, but I can just jump and catch the thing and they do it and it works. So you don't want to say like, well, that's wrong because they're finding success and that's what we want. Right. It, it works. Yeah. Uh, if you do it, it's, it's kind of right. <laughs> yeah. Right. It's not wrong, but it could be right in another way, maybe, or writer. Or you're uh, passing, you're passing over something that, you're passing over another tool that will be helpful for you eventually. And you're just missing well the opportunity yeah. to, to learn that tool. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. 100%. So that you can use so, these like toolbox uh, analogies for them of like, cool, you can do it this way. Can you do it other ways? And maybe even try our, our coal strategy and hopefully you have better results than we had with coal. But uh, the idea works, I think. They're like, have you watched Thor? He uses a hammer for everything. I don't understand. <laughs> yeah. It works great for him. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and what's interesting is this, this same idea plays out in the good, not strong beginner climber as well. Um, and so, like Matt said, like with the kind of toolbox metaphor, the goal for the beginner climber overall is to diversify the toolbox, diversify the experiences that you have, diversify the different ways that you can solve problems in climbing and not get pigeonholed into one way of doing things. So with this like strong, not good guy, you know, what they've been successful at and what kind of is always front of mind is just crushing stuff. Um, but on the other end of the spectrum, you've got the string bean, it's me, <laughs> uh, where it, it becomes all about, uh, I, when I see people doing this, I'm like, you're just trying to be slick. You know, you're trying, mm -hmm. you'll find any, you get really good at using any other tool, but strength. You're like, if, if I can crimp this foothold or like get my thumb in this little thing or, or, do some crazy contortion thing to get around the thing that like I'm looking at and I know I just, what they want is for me to hold this crimp and like pull through to the next one. But, um, literally doing everything else, but that you, uh, you basically break the beta if, on every single rock climb. Like you just have to find a different way of doing it and you always resort to yeah. cleverness and, and sneaky tricks and stuff. Always yeah. trying to find a way to sneak through, which is a really great tool <laughs> and a, and a good also thing to works, cultivate and right? a good thing to learn. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Like you want that. Um, but if if you overutilize that to solve too many problems, then same thing in both directions. You're just you're leaving something really important on the table that you are eventually gonna have to go back and reckon with if you don't take care of it proactively. Um, yeah. Can I, so, can I chime in here? Yeah. Yeah. I just had a yeah. thought cause this, this does get like quite nuanced and it's interesting. Um, on that point, like you're, you're also, I was not a string bean, but you're describing my issue in Leavenworth, but this, this stuff just for people, um, to think about it a little bit more deeply, it can kind of hide, like I, it can kind of be sneaky, you know, like I was a strong looking dude with muscles but I would use my muscular strength to avoid finger strength at all costs. I didn't have the Ooh. finger strength. And so I would like mm -hmm. do Good. crazy squeeze moves and do crazy heel hooks and like, you know, buy new shoes if I thought they would heel hook a little better on this little crystal so I could just crank this hole down and lock off and skip the shitty cramp or whatever. But, um, but I just want to touch on that. Like it's not always just avoiding strength. It can be avoiding very specific weaknesses. Um, that was my case. Yeah. That's yeah. A really good I mean, what point. it really comes, what it comes down to is just over whatever the thing is that you are initially kind of naturally good at over utilizing that as a problem solving tool. And that ends up hiding all this other stuff that you could be learning. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, Matt brought up one uh, tool that, that we've used historically to help address that kind of thing. And that's fatigue. So if someone is like extra strong, say for you, like squeezing, um, trying to fatigue 
that part of you so that when you're presented with a challenge in like a, a training scenario or practice scenario, you're incentivized or de-incentivized to utilize that tool and are incentivized to maybe try something else. And there's all sorts of ways you can kind of manipulate the way that you go about climbing and add different constraints to help you not build an over-reliance on certain things. Um, I've used all sorts of different rules over time um, to emphasize other aspects of a person's climbing. Um, you can do things like, okay, I know you can climb this, but can you climb it without your feet cutting on every move? Hmm. Or can you climb this boulder and not use your thumbs on anything? Like, do you don't pinch any of these holds and you're going to have to find a way to adjust your body position more in order to like gain an advantageous position for these holds rather than just crushing it in your fist. Um, do you, so can I bring up an interesting yeah, constraint yeah. here? I think we've all seen the drill of like robot arms being used in climbing gyms or somewhere like do this climb, but don't bend your elbows at all. I think th that is a good concept to teach people like especially their, their first day in climbing or maybe if someone has hammer like tendencies to try to take away their elbow bendy stuff away from them um but really that's not the best way to teach movement patterns so like bending your elbows isn't really what we're trying to teach people not to do we're trying to teach them not to generate force from their elbow flexors most of the time so like for instance if you're on slab and you need to stand up and you need to just do one of these guys, your elbow is going to bend no matter how much or little force is coming from your shoulder elbow area, right? Even if 99% of that force is coming from your toe. So I don't really love that coaching cue as a constraint. Um, but to Will's point, I think uh, finding creative ways to limit, whether it's your own or other people that you're working with, it problem solving abilities is the best way to move forward. And Will, I got to give you a shout out here. Will wrote a great blog years ago, I think on the tension blog called rules, mm. um, all about this idea that by cheating boulders, particularly, I think Will, maybe you wrote it in the context of like board climbing. Is that right? I think it, it was, I, I was trying to create a clear delineation between practice and performance mm, there you where go. that kind of no holds barred, like, cause like if you're in a comp or you're going rock climbing, you're like actually trying to do something, do whatever the heck is going to make you successful. Like use whatever tools going to work. But if, if we're trying to learn or we're trying to get better at climbing or we're trying to practice, it's, it can often be very helpful to, add those constraints as a way to like direct the intention of a session in a particular way. And, and that was an article kind of specifically about some different ways that I've utilized over time. Yeah. So I think if you'd like want to dive more into this or if someone listening wants to dive more into this idea of how to put constraints on your climbing and kind of help jog your thought process, find that uh, rules blog on the tension page. That's, that's a good one. I've used uh, stolen specific drills right out of that, or just used that thought process and gotten creative on my own for my own climbing. And as a coach, that's super helpful resource for that. Very cool. Yeah. I'll link to that for people. Okay. I want to, I want to kind of, Oh, go ahead. Do you have more? Oh, I was going to say, so one of the, we we spoke really specifically, I think about the climbing, like for the beginner climber, uh, but not so much about, potential other interventions like off the climbing wall uh that that might be useful for this kind of a for either of these people um do you want to speak to any of that yeah definitely i think uh ooh, maybe uh, i'll do the string bean you do the hammer the other way we'll switch it up okay. a little bit just for fun and then you can tell me if i'm wrong in your experience yeah so because i think having... this will help lead us into intermediate in a, in a way for sure uh so I think uh, upon starting to coach climbing kind of early in my climbing career, I, I felt a little exposed that I was not as good a rock climber, not only as some of my coaching peers, Will included, but even some of the kids that I was coaching. 
So I found that like, I was trying to find ways that I could be most effective. And a lot of that was the many, many like highly successful string beans, the good, not strong folks on team didn't know how to prepare their body to be able to handle more anything. And I think that's, that's really what the good, not strong beginner climber needs to be able to do. They have a lot of tools in their toolbox, but they don't have a hammer. They can't, their body just can't provide more juice or sustain more force or, uh, yeah, like it, more damage inflicted on it would be very detrimental to this person. So being able to find ways to cultivate those adaptations off the wall was something that I really gravitated towards and trying to help a lot of these athletes early on in my coaching career where coming from a multi-sport background, I could say like, yeah, I know how to make you stronger. I know how to make you more injury resilient and all these other things. And that's what I've found to be really successful for this good, not strong person is you're a pretty good rock climber at this point, meaning you have a lot of skills and stuff, but there's like really only one or two things that are holding you back from progressing quite rapidly. If, in my opinion, they're not rocket science, but they do take dedicated hard work, right? Like, I think any coach or trainer who you ask like for gym specific workouts would tell you that it's not rocket science doing a three sets of 10 or four by four in the gym or whatever it might be for your bench press, your squat, your kettlebell swings, pick an exercise, not complicated stuff. You just have to do it. And this athlete is generally very adverse to spending time doing it because climbing is awesome. They love rock climbing and, as well they should, and they're finding success in probably most avenues of climbing, except for the ones that require this one specific tool. Do you feel like that's accurate, Will? Totally. Yeah. And something I feel like I missed out on early in my climbing career, because I didn't, I didn't want to spend my time doing pull-ups or doing push-ups or, you know, any, any of that stuff. I wanted to, I wanted to just boulder more and sport climb. And, and like you said, you're, if you're finding success there, it's hard to get that person to be like, maybe, maybe stop 30 to 45 minutes early. And like, let's right. bend some elbows. <laughs> it's a hard sell. It's a hard sell. It's for, for this person, it's not as fun where yeah. I think maybe yeah. the opposite is true for the strong, not good beginner climber where speaking from experience, like if I couldn't do something, I've found success thus far by going and lifting more weights or doing other stuff that's not rock climbing related. Where really what I need to do is anything but that. Like I, I need to be spending as much time as possible doing rock climbing stuff just to diversify the tools I have available to me, problem solve on the fly and just get more reps of that kind of stuff. Um, but this person has found success in the gym and therefore is more likely to continue go spending a lot more time in there. So, I, I mean, we've seen these people who climb V3 and can do weighted pull-ups with their body weight and stuff. And you're like, they're bashing their head against the wall. I mean, like, why am I not climbing V11 yet? I'm so strong. Well, yeah, but you stink at rock climbing. So <laughs> like, it doesn't really help you very much here. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Identifying the low hanging fruit. Like that's, that's essentially what we're going to be talking about all the way through here um and early on it's it, oftentimes if uh like if maybe this isn't always true push push back if if this is if this is bs but i at least for myself i often find if if i'm like if there's something i'm that's really easy to get myself to do i will kind of question how much time i really got to spend doing that and if i'm if i start thinking about something i'm like oh like you know should really start, uh, you know, working on my pulling strength more. And I'm like, yeah, but I don't know. I do like, uh, that's a, if I'm apprehensive about it, it's usually something that I need to spend more time like thinking about or engaging with. And if it's something that's really easy to make myself do, it's usually something that I'm already good at and maybe don't need to spend a ton of time focusing on. Yeah. Makes sense. That's pretty accurate. Yeah. Um, can I summarize things? Cause the, okay. So we just talked about the beginner climber. We started off with strong, not 
good. It kind of bled into good, not strong. And we kind of talked about both of them together. Um, I want to summarize the goals of each of those types of climbers and um, touch on the intervention, like what they should actually do. And then uh, see if, see if I'm getting everything and we can move on to intermediate. Um, yeah. Cool. So yeah, the, the beginner climber who's strong, but not good. The goal is to diversify your toolbox. You're a hammer, but there's a lot of other tools. Don't forget that. And then just keep developing that meat suit competence. You know, I don't know that can come in so many different forms. You can definitely learn that through climbing, but, um, I don't know, doing yoga, doing some dance, like stuff like that might really help that type of climber. Um, so the intervention there is learning more about problem solving, identifying which tool is being asked of you for climbs. Um, you guys had some physical preparation, tissue prep stuff on here. Do you want to touch on that as far as the, the strong, not good climber? Yeah. Yeah. I think this is, this is something where it often gets kind of thrown under the umbrella of like mobility. Um, and I don't know, that's a reasonable way to, to talk about it. Um, but uh, Matt, save me. <laughs> save me. Uh, I think basically that this person needs to work on any physical quality that you wouldn't categorize as strength. Mm, that's a good way of saying it. Yeah. So, you know, there's a lot of other stuff. Like, uh, again, speaking from experience, this person's ability to climb for a long time stinks. They can climb at their max for a very finite period of time, but their climbing specific capacity stinks. So doing some base training, aerobic training, endurance training, however you want to define that, super beneficial to this person because that allows them to just climb more, which is what they need. So really just to sum it up, I think anything that's not continuing to build your strength capacity is where you should be spending your off wall time. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then summarizing the good but not strong beginner climber, you guys called this 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 person the string bean. Um, I liked the word crowbar. You threw that in there too. This is someone who's really good at using leverage, using all their tricks. Um, so the goal here also meet suit competence. Just get you know better at using your body. And for this climber, it's probably going to be getting used to just trying hard and pulling hard. Um, those sorts of things. And then you wrote acquiring strength skills. I really like that. Um, yeah, working, working on, on some of those more physical things. And, um, let's see here. Yeah. You talked about some tissue prep thing and you also talked about kind of breaking out practice and training session in addition to just performance. That makes sense to me like that good, but not strong climber, especially the beginner climbers are usually good because they're just kind of in performance mode all the time. They're always trying to squeak out like the last percentage to get up, you know, their first V7 when they really have like V4 level strength. Um, so that it sounds like that climber needs to learn how to think about climbing as practice and also is about training to kind of round themselves out. But feel free to to add anything else there. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's I think that's great. And it the the strength skills portion, I mean, this is definitely something that uh, a beginner climber can work on off the wall in the gym. I mean, it's one of those things like climbing involves a lot of pulling. If, if doing pull-ups is not a comfortable thing for you, um, working on a pull-up progression off the wall is great. Um, and more than just pulling like general physical preparedness, depending on, you know, where you're starting out, but you can also climb in a way that will facilitate those kinds of improvements as well. Um, uh, this is something, uh, I, nature lay has been putting out some really cool content, uh, related to this, but just talking about the way that the terrain that you're climbing on is going to tax you in different ways. And so, you know, if you're climbing on mostly vert to slab, slightly overhung, you're going to be able to get away more usually without having to do a lot of the hard pulling, but you get into some steep terrain and all of a sudden, like you, you do have to keep your arms bent and you have to start pulling. And so, um, this is another one of those things, generally speaking with the beginner climber, like we talked about gaining experience across a lot of different climbing styles and a lot of terrain and using those different styles and using that different terrain as a training stimulus, because it's new. 
it's all very new. Um, and so you can have a physically hard kind of pulling day, focusing on climbing steep boulder problems or steep routes. And you could have a more kind of technically oriented day where we're climbing on lower angle stuff. Um, and like Matt said, getting in, uh, trying to just improve your overall capacity for climbing load. You could do, uh, you know, drills where you're getting some cumulative fatigue, forcing your body to recover over a certain period of time. Or if you're primarily a uh, boulder, um, and you have access to rope climbing, climbing routes is a really great intervention, um, or longer boulder problems, depending on, on what you have access to, but really trying to include some variation across the board. Yeah, I, just, I agree. And just want to add one thing that when somebody goes to try to do this and create your own drills and put your own constraints on yourself, uh, checking your ego is a really big thing here where like, if you're a V4 rock climber and you feel like you're on the cusp of kind of busting through that beginner level into the intermediate world, that doesn't mean that like climbing V2s in a particular way that will just described is below you or something, right? right? That like, that's probably what you need to be doing. Like I, I listened to, uh, you had Steve Bechtel on and he talked about how campus training is maybe too hard for, a, as a power stimulus for a lot of people and really like putting your feet on and just doing big explosive moves and just focusing on the power output is the better way to go. But that's kind of a tough pill to swallow for some people to be like, well, I've seen so-and-so campus on the thing and they're super powerful. It's like, that's great. And hopefully you'll get there at some point, but like, what is the, I, the term I use, but folks I work with is train to the adaptation you're looking to get, not to a V grade. You think you should be able to execute that thing on. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think that's really key for this person. Like the amount of really strong rock climbers that I wish would have gotten that concept earlier on is vast. They would have made that improvement so much faster. So, mm. uh, no one is going to judge you for doing these drills on like, maybe not your hardest grade ever. And if they are, they're a jerk. So screw them anyways. But, yeah. uh, that, I think that's like a, a good thing to keep in mind as you're trying to build this stuff for yourself. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. To, to Will, um, to your point about nature lay, um, and what he's been sharing. I think you and I basically talked about that in our last episode. Um, I shared that, you know, when I climbed at Smith Rock and was dancing my way up sport climbs, um, I felt like I had to spend time in the weight gym and doing heavy hangboarding to kind of even maintain body strength and like deeper strength. Um, whereas, you know, now I travel and I've spent the last few winters in Waco and after a season in Waco, I like, I'm like stronger than before all around, you know, in every, in every way. And I rarely do any supplemental anything. I just go climbing in Waco. So yeah, I mean, what you're doing, the type of climbing you're doing, how you're doing it, um, can really go a long way as far as rounding out some of those strengths. Yeah. And you're, and when you're building that by climbing, you're also building the skill alongside of it. And the, so the application of that strength is built in. Um, which, you know, super important regardless of, uh, regardless of the level that you're at. Mm -hmm. Um, and to kind of, uh, can we transition into intermediate? Let's do it. Yeah. Cool. So this is, uh, this is a really interesting transition and Matt and I spent a lot of time, um, chatting about this one. Um, this is, this is one of those things where I, this is a, uh, for whatever, this is a pet peeve of mine. <laughs> this, this point in the climber's career, and it usually happens like around V4 to V6 or so, but it's the first time that folks will start to use the word plateau. And I think that initially they kind of don't totally understand what that means. Like that plateauing is, is a pretty specific concept. And what really starts happening as people exit this beginner stage is the improvement just starts to slow down. And 
the reality is the improvement is going to continue to slow down the further you go along. When you start off, you're a beginner climber, everything's new, anything you do works. Oftentimes people have this experience of like every couple of weeks, next V grade, like a month or two, next V grade, and get pretty used to this consistent progression through grades. And this is a period of time where I think it's 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 extra important to try to learn how to contextualize progress separate from the grades. Because like we were just talking about, you know, a quote unquote, so someone who might call themselves like I'm a V4 climber and put themselves in that box might actually like need to be doing laps on V0 to V2 in the steep cave as the stimulus that they need to like improve their power or their pulling strength or something like that. And when you, when you start to attach your progression to the grade, like Matt said, it becomes difficult to climb on something that you feel like is maybe beneath you. But when your conception of progress is a little bit more nuanced and is more relative to a specific skill or a specific strength or what have you, comes easier to understand what kind of climbing or what kind of intervention might actually help you progress that individual skill. And it's not, doesn't always have to be next V grade. Um, and so the, our, our note for the intermediate climber is this like, oh no, now what? Like, holy shit, I've been climbing V5 for two or three months. What's wrong with me? Like, what do I do? Like, is this, is this as hard as I'm ever going to climb? And, mm. um, no, you're fine. Everything's cool. Like you're just starting to get into it. Like this is climbing really, um, learning how joke. to deal with that. <laughs> yeah. We, we've been joking about that. Like the minute you have that, Oh no, now what the answer is congrats. You just figured out what rock climbing is <laughs> in our opinion, right? Like, cool. Welcome to the club. We're all here bashing our head against the wall, trying to move forward an inch and inch at a time. Uh, it, I think it's like the welcome to reality moment mm. for most rock climbers where you're not getting better every time you go into the gym anymore, mm -hmm. which I think is pretty cool. But I I've been yeah. rough with some athletes in the past who have hit this point and been like, Hey, like if this relationship to sport is not okay with you, that's fine. But rock climbing may not be your jam, mm -hmm. right? Like just so you know, so you don't have to like wait a whole bunch and hope that things are going to change. Cause it's probably not gonna, hopefully, and you know, this happens from athlete to athlete, maybe at V seven, you hit like a huge jump in your training. And now you've accelerated to like eight, nine, 10 really quick. That happens from time to time. And, but for the most part, this is how it's going to be until you decide to stop rock climbing. So yeah. uh, take it or leave it. Yeah. And, and you, uh, it almost like improvement almost becomes like logarithmic or something. I was talking about this with, uh, mm -hmm. Jesse Firestone the other day. And I, I don't totally understand how it all works because when I look at grades in like the space that they take up in the rear view mirror, you know, like V6 and 7 and 8 all feel like similar size blocks. But when you're trying to go from 10 to 11, it feels like it goes from this wide to like three times as wide to like 10 times as wide, you know. Um, it just it just feels like there's an exponential amount of growth and development and learning um, and strengthening and skill developing and all those things that needs to happen to, to get to the next level. But the cool thing is like, at first that feels really discouraging. It's like, Oh my God, if I'm stuck at V6, how am I ever going to get to V10? Um, but the cool thing is it, you just, you do actually, there's so much more room for growth. It's just not going to, um, deliver the same linear progression through the grades, but you're going to feel like twice as good of a rock climber by the time you reach V8. And you're going to feel like five times as good of a rock climber by the time you get to V9 or 10 or whatever it is. And, and that's really satisfying because it opens up um, the door for like such a breadth of cool experiences. Cause all of a sudden you can climb all the V6s in different styles, if that's what you want to do or climb them a lot better and, and just feel more um, confident and flowy at those grades. It just, it, it it's worth it. Like it's a great journey. It's awesome. Even if it feels a little frustrating when you, when you start to feel those grades 
slow down. So, dude, that's like a really great, more optimistic side of the coin than what I just said. That's awesome. <laughs> like, yeah, I wish everybody <laughs> said exactly what you just said of like, oh, well, I can climb pinchy V6s, but only V3 crimpy things. And then like, oh, well, there's so much more for me to learn before I get to V8 on my pinchy things in that between V3 and V6 and every other way that I rock climb. Yeah, yeah dude, that's, thank you for saying that. That's awesome. Everyone should do yeah, what you just that's said. The way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, it's just kind of my story right now. Like I haven't, you know, I, I don't know. I, sport climbing in particular, I haven't progressed a grade in a long time. I, I did my first 13D somewhere between 2013 and 2017, depending on what where the grades landed on specific routes I did, you know. But um, but I haven't climbed 514. But I I have become like a completely different climber in the last six years, you know, since that um 2017 route. And um I just I just enjoy my climbing so much more now. I feel like I can go to any crag and climb at at least a similar level. You know, I'm not going to go from Smith Rock having climbed my first 13D to the red and not be able to climb 13A. You know, like that's that doesn't feel very good. Um if you want to travel and and taste and like try other you know styles and things. But now I feel like cool. I just yeah, I, I just feel like my whole base, my whole like skill set, the toolbox is so much more full and um it's just more satisfying and fun. So yeah. And it, it shows me too that like, oh, I think, I think there's a lot further, I could build a lot higher on this base now. Like it, it was kind of this rickety scaffolding, you know, <laughs> um, even though I had like a pretty big pyramid, it was all within a narrow style. Um, so anytime I branched out of that, mm. I was missing a lot, but now I feel like it's just, it, it's just so much more robust and that, yeah, that's been really satisfying. And, and there's a ton of growth in the last six years without having climbed the new grade. So anyway, that's where I'm coming from, but, but yeah, it can also be discouraging that. at times too, for sure. When you, you know, there's those moments where you're like, God damn it. I really thought I would have done that by now. <laughs> I, yeah. I think there's yeah. an actually like an interesting thing to pull out here that maybe kind of segues us back into the intermediate discussion here is that, you know, you're done a bunch of hard 13s, but yet to have your first 14 in my experience as a coach, you're probably strong enough to do your first 14 without having to go back and go through like a bunch of physical training. It's more about like finding the one climb that you're really psyched on that maybe fits your profile just the right way. And you've got enough time and good vibes at the crag for you to just get up that thing. And I think one of our like big qualities we're trying to pull out of the intermediate category here is really finding what trying hard means in the world of rock climbing, uh, Will and I did a little, you know, nationals training camp for the kids. Maybe this was like 10, 12 years ago at this point. And Will asked the kids, but Will spent a lot of time setting a bunch of routes, like a full rope mock comp for the kids overnight. He was there way too late in my opinion, but it was awesome. And the kids like, <laughs> they were great. <laughs> they were sick routes. Yeah, they were great. <laughs> the kids tried, but they didn't really like leave it all out there. And to use a Michael Jordan meme, Will took that personally. And so his talk with the kids was like, okay, raise your hand if you felt like you tried hard. And maybe like two thirds, three quarters of the hands go up. And he was just like, no, none of you tried hard. And we pulled up a picture. It was like, it was early days, Adam Andro time of Andro, like screaming until his eyeballs shoot out of his head, kind of like his signature move. Right. And Will said, this is trying hard. Did anybody try this hard today? Mm. No hands go up. And he's like, cool. We're not going to do anything else except you need to get back on the wall and try that hard. People got farther on their route we didn't do anything magically from like a coaching or training perspective. Hell, it was the same afternoon. Like we didn't have time to do that stuff, but seeing that like light bulb moment for a lot of them of like, Oh, there's a ton more left in the tank here. And I do have, there's like other opportunities for me to apply the things I already know by just kind of like stepping on the gas a little harder. 
mm-hmm. where they thought they were redlining before. Will, do you remember this? I do. I do remember. Yeah, I was. I was not Man. super pleased. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I remember it. Too. I was like, yeah. <laughs> I was like, are we here to give it or what? Like, if like if y'all don't want to try hard, then we can just stop now. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was that was a good one. Um, <laughs> and really, learning learning how to try hard is like super key. And it's not always like I, I like to try and make a differentiation, or at least kind of talk about it in a, a slightly more nuanced way, where. Like I want people to try well, mm. you know, because hard has like a certain connotation and, and in a lot of instances, trying hard is what you need to do. Like squeeze the shit out of that hold, jump as hard as you can, pull as hard as you can, whatever it is. But I think trying well or trying better is maybe a little bit more kind of all encompassing of what we're trying to get across to this, this intermediate climber, um, especially the good, not strong, or sorry, strong, not good, where that person is probably pretty good at, at trying hard, but for them trying well is something that they probably ought to work on and vice versa for that good, not strong person. They're probably pretty good at trying well. They're probably good at like applying just the right amount of force in just the right way at just the right time to kind of get the outcome that they want. But when they're put into a position where it really is like, to to borrow uh, my friend Roland's term, eyes closed, everything flexed, they don't know how to do that. And so learning on both ends of the spectrum there, like, if I'm really good at just cranking, how do I better direct my ability to like apply that level of force and try hard for a positive outcome? And if I'm really good at kind of being tricky and finding all of these subtle little things, how can I learn to bring like a level of intensity to that, that I am not currently doing? Mm. Yeah. I love that. That's, that's great. Okay. Where are we? Where did we land here? Are we, that was kind of an introduction to intermediate with some tangents thrown in there, but it was all, it was all great. Yeah. Do we want to dive all into all tangents all the time? <laughs> all tangents all the we, time. <laughs> if we take one step back from that, I think it rolls us right into the beginning of the intermediate here of like okay. What Will just articulated is 110% true. But how do you know where you lie on what it is what it is that you need to address? Are you really good at trying hard? Maybe it's kind of like hard to know where you're at at this point in your, at any point in your climbing journey, but particularly here, do I need to try harder? Do I know what a hundred percent is or is 82 really what I think a hundred percent is, or do I need to be focusing on trying better or whatever it might be? So I think like a big theme that we're asking of intermediate climbers here is to be able to start being a little bit more analytical of what's happening. Why are things happening the way that they're happening? This is where it's super useful to have like either a good crew to climb with, a coach, video yourself, whatever it might be, but to start figuring out like really what's happening and why that thing is happening. Um, I think uh, one of my favorite like basic drills for this was uh, freeze when you fall. So if you fall off, you get spit off your boulder, freeze wherever you fell. Don't turn around and look at the wall. Don't move at all why did you land where you just landed? And this is like an always an interesting puzzle to give people to me for myself included, right? Like if I stick it like a gymnast, like, okay, it's maybe a little bit easier to piece apart why I just fell. But if I get rocketed off the wall and spin and flip 180 and smash my face into the pad, there's a lot more to unpack there. But those things (laughs) should... Yeah, I mean, emotionally unpack also, right? There's a little bit of emotional bruising there for sure. <laughs> but there's pro- hopefully more stuff for me to learn from because of that wacky fall that I just took. So I think, uh, well, save me. I'm, I'm rambling about. You yeah, know, yeah. So, so with a beginner climber, it's really tough. Like they don't, they'll often fall and be like, why'd you fall? Like, I have no idea. Like they won't even know what hand they were going to a hold with. Mm. You know what I mean? And that 
makes sense. Everything's very fresh. It getting into this intermediate zone, this is really where, like, in order to improve, you're gonna have to start being, you're gonna have to understand why those things are happening and and pay more attention to those things. Like if you fall, why did you fall? Like what came off first? Did your hand come off first or did your foot come off first? Like if you can't tell the difference between those two things, like you you need to be able to. Like yeah. this is that is a learning opportunity. Or like, why did your foot slip? If you if it was your foot, why was it your foot? Was it because totally. you didn't place it quite right? Was it because you took pressure off of it too soon? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then, and, and even when you're successful, so it's like, okay, my foot picked, why? Maybe it's because I didn't put enough weight on it. Okay, cool. So more weight on the foot this time. They do it again. Okay, we're successful. The foot didn't pick. Did you have more weight on the foot? Yes or no? If they're like, no then okay well then what else made you successful or if yes the foot did stay on and i put more weight on it how did you put more weight on it Mm. what about what you did for the try that you were successful was different from the try where you were unsuccessful starting to get analytical like that and breaking things down and and when you're asked a question about either the success or the failure you are able to answer that question um, and over time, answer it better and better. This is where uh, Matt and I really started talking with each other about this concept of bandwidth. And this is something that increases like throughout a person's climbing career, their ability to take in all of this external and internal information and turn it into something that is actually usable and not just passing through. Um, they really taking seriously the kind of uh, conscious part of this progression, the co- going from conscious incompetence to conscious competence, understanding what you're doing, if it's working or not working, why it's working or not working, and how you can change what you're doing to have a better outcome. Is this is this relevant for the hammer and the string bean? As far this as is immediate. this is for both yeah. for sure. This is just generally Global. as like an intermediate climber. This is this is that just a super critical piece, and this is something where like I've like if you can't invest in this and start to move through this process, it becomes very difficult to get anywhere past this point. Mm. Um, climbing only gets harder. It only gets harder. It only gets more complicated, and so starting to build out a system for yourself for uh, whether it's you call it self-assessment, self-awareness, just understanding what you're doing. If you don't understand what the pieces to the puzzle are, you're going to have a really hard time putting them together. Okay. Puzzles only get wonkier from here. (laughs) (laughs) Should we dive into intermediate, strong, not good? Let's. Okay. For sure. What are some of the well, issues wanna... that that climber faces? So, okay. Well, there are lots. Like we'll just mention the bandwidth analogy is something we'll come back to a lot. I think uh, when this person is asked, why did you fall? Their answer most of the time is either, I either hear it as like a blank face and you hear like dial up tone noises in the background. Or their answer is, I'm not strong enough, mm. which, as we've established in the beginner category, is likely not the mm. case for this person. So, Or like, I couldn't hold on. Like, I couldn't hold on to that hold or something. Right. It's like, you're like, like forms yeah. are the size of my neck. So, like, maybe that's not the case. Like, <laughs> or, or maybe it is, right? There's always some bad holds for everybody. But uh, most of the time for this person, it's starting to... I, I, I like this... Um, chunking concept they need to break things down into smaller pieces the way i describe this to my youth athletes is if you picture a phone number and you take out the hyphens and you mush all those numbers together remembering that phone number is really tough for your brain to be able to digest so we stick hyphens in so that you get chunks of numbers to remember at a time there's been a lot of studies on this kind of thing if you want to google chunking it's a thing that you can look up um, your brain really likes chunks of like three to eight items, whether they're numbers, shapes, or otherwise. 
And then you can have three to eight chunks of chunks and you can build from there. So, you know, whether that's uh, a few moves at a time or a few parts of a move at a time, right? So to use Will, Will's example, if you don't know if your foot or hand is coming off or if you didn't put enough weight on your foot, a lot of people struggle with moving laterally before they go up to weight a foot if their foot is outside their box. So we'll use that as an example, right? So, okay, cool. Like, did you feel your hip hamstring something move you towards your foot before you started to go up, right? That could be one chunk that we focus on before we try to work on attacking the next hold. So all that's to say, the specifics don't really matter. Breaking stuff down into smaller chunks that will let you focus on more than I didn't hold the hold is key here. Yeah, getting getting beyond the the left, right, left. And, and like, okay, left hand to that hold, but where and how? And then what? Like mm, micro beta. It, yeah, it gets uh I also like to think about it as kind of like a resolution thing. Um the more advanced you get and the harder things get, the the closer you have to look and the closer you look, something that seemed like one thing, like, oh, I just need to grab this pinch is actually a couple of things. Like I need to grab this pinch. My like index finger needs to be here. My thumb needs to be here. I need to be standing on the foothold this way so that like I'm pushing into it. Like it can get all of a sudden things start to balloon and there's actually a ton of things going on. And so I think that's that's part of what Matt's talking about with the chunking and like getting into smaller chunks, subdividing the information that you're dealing with uh, smaller and smaller. And this happens over time. Like uh, the, I feel like this intermediate zone is where uh, climbers spend a lot of time. Honestly, like the, the further you go along, the longer you're going to spend in any of these zones. Beginner can move, you can move through that relatively quickly. Intermediate is a meaty time. Mm. <laughs> There's a lot going on, a lot to learn. Um, and the, the, the strong, not good person, uh, really trying to help them understand that they can be successful in more ways. Um, and I found that, that breaking the chunks down helps people understand that there are more dials that they can turn. Um, it's not like the, the answer to it isn't, oh, the sequence is left, left, right, instead of left, right, left. It's much more subtle than that. It has to do with how you're taking a hold, how you're taking a foothold, the trajectory that your body's taking. Like Matt said, people often have trouble like going over before they get up or even understanding that that's a thing that you would do uh, it is like, yeah, but the holds it's, up there. Why would I go that? Right, like that. That yeah. thought incongruence is not there yet. Mm. Uh, I think, and this in is... terms of like, what do you do? Right, I think that's the next case of like, cool. Like, we're asking you to look for more subtlety here and pay closer attention. But like, easier said than done, right? Uh, Will, do you want to lead us into like, okay, cool? you asked me to like figure out if I stepped on the left side of the hold or the right side of the hold. And I said, uh, but like, how do I build that into my practice? Yeah, this, I, I like the just kind of guess and check model. <laughs> I could never memorize my times table. So I'm familiar <laughs> with the guess and check. Uh, <laughs> but if, if someone comes down and they're like, I don't know what happened. I'm like, all right, we'll do it again. And like, tell me something you're going to do on purpose. Like, if you don't remember where your foot was, like, pick a spot, try again. And they pick a spot and they do it. It doesn't work. We're like, okay, now we know that that doesn't work. Like, we have, like, a discrete piece of information. Stepping on that foothold that way is not helpful to us. So let's try another way. Try stepping on it, like, with a different part of your shoe or a different part of the foothold or something. And going through that process and starting to turn those dials and letting the climber like generate as much of that as possible it's not that helpful like if you're a coach listening to this if you just keep telling the athlete what to do they're not going to learn how to do it on their own if you're not there and that's not helpful mm -hmm. <laughs> uh 
um, yeah. allow them to have that cognitive dissonance of be like, like, do you think I should do so? Like put my foot like this and in your head, you're like, there's no way that's going to work. And be like, I don't know, give it a shot see what happens like learning what doesn't work at this point is just as important as learning what does work mm. um really trying to encourage the climber to explore and just try turning dials and and when they don't work having a conversation about why and when they do work having a conversation about why um like matt said having having a great crew of people to climb with um really helps improve the quality of what we're talking about and the rate of improvement. If you're just solo all the time, it's really tough to, to self-assess this kind of thing without some form of dialogue. Totally. And I think, uh, we've talked a lot and this is a term that gets thrown a lot in the like climbing verse of training is drills, but drills can take any form you want. And to Will's earlier point about rules and constraints, like you can just make them up to serve your purpose in the moment. So I think in the goal of trying to figure out what works and what doesn't trying to create drills that force over exaggeration of one style or another is a really important thing. So I'll use an example. I believe I stole this from Chris Hampton is the sloth monkey drill where you do a boulder twice in a row. The first time is the sloth. You climb it as slowly and statically as humanly possible. It's not the right way to climb the boulder by any stretch, but that's not the point. You're trying to figure out what moves maybe feel good that way and what moves feel really horrible that way. And upon like maybe making it halfway through a move, you might find that like, oh man, I'm getting really pooped having to lock this off and going three seconds from hold to hold. So I'm going to need to change my body position to find something more economical. And maybe you just discovered how to drop knee for the first time by accident, by nature of being tired, right? That's a pretty cool thing to just kind of stumble into. And the next time you do that boulder, you're going to do it like a monkey, super loose, super dynamic, using momentum everywhere you possibly can. Again, there's going to be moves that are like absolutely not meant to be done that way and you'll find out pretty quickly <laughs> but there's going to be moves that you do that when you're like holy shit that was way easier than trying to like slowly crank through this move the right answer to do that climb is probably a mix of two things or somewhere in between but you don't really know where the line is until you cross it uh what will and i use this term all the time uh I think it's from the uh, Dave Chappelle, uh, Charlie Murphy story about Prince, or maybe Rick James. I think it's the Rick James one that you don't want to be a habitual line stepper. You can cross a line once and it's probably pretty good for you. You just don't want to cross it all the time. So in my opinion, drills are about finding where the line is and you want to cross it to, so that you can backtrack to be like, cool, that's the sweet spot. I like that. That's cool. Yeah. This is also how I introduce uh, um, hip in versus square positions mm -hmm. in climbing. Um, and another great drill for like the intermediate climber is picking a climb, cl doing every move square, like hips square to the wall, knees out. Do it again, turn your hips in on every single move. Mm -hmm. And as you're doing it, you'll realize that some of these moves feel better this way. Some of them feel better this other way. You get down you have a discussion about, okay, cool. Move one. Awesome. We want to do that square. That felt really good. Move two, definitely going to want to turn the hip. That was way easier. And you start to kind of construct an ideal way of climbing the climb and then, okay, now execute and be able to shift from climbing in a square position to a hip in position and back in an efficient manner. And then all of a sudden, Cool. And we've just now learned how to problem solve in, in some way. Um, and so I think for the intermediate climber, engaging in that is really important for the strong, not good. Um, that is really helpful to help them sort of break out of their normal problem solving mode by just forcing them to try and solve something a specific way. And 
for the good not strong you can kind of you can take the same drill and tweak it the other direction um and have it be more of like a strength stimulus um we have we have like a a pretty big list of stuff here so i don't know if we <laughs> want to um try and knock all of them out like listing drills i think the the core thing to understand is like what we're trying to do here is really engage with the problem solving elements of climbing and start to build a process as a climber for how to like in some form of a stepwise fashion go about solving these different problems we encounter in climbing and try to understand the tools that may or may not be at our disposal, given whatever the circumstances are. Um, and that I think really encompasses generally what we're trying to do on the wall. Um, but for an intermediate climber off the wall, um, I think we're, we're starting to explore more as well. Um, this is a this is still a scenario i think and and matt let me let me know what you think where the the situation where like kind of like anything you do works is still kind of in play for the intermediate climber there's they don't need that much structure for the physical training like off off the wall stuff i find it's more like learning new exercises. So when we get to a point where we do really need to get in and start structuring like a physical training plan, it's not like the first time that this person has ever done like an overhead press or uh, like a weighted shoulder car or, or something, uh, something like that. Yeah, definitely. I think, uh, a lot of really good youth coaches in any sport, but uh, I'll shout out the homie Tyson Chaney real quick that uh, he talks a lot about like vertical world climbing teams known for producing really great athletes of many different age categories. But, you know, when I first showed up in Seattle, I had more questions than I had answers that I didn't know what to do with all. I just wanted to like sit Tyson down for like four whole days and just grill him. Uh, and luckily he was pretty cool with me doing that. But one of them was like, dude, like, how are you creating all of these like really strong C, B, A climbers? Like, how are they doing this? He's like, ah, that's, that's them, right? They're just good athletes. Like the program's goal is to create athletes who are going to peak when humans are supposed to peak mm. in your twenties, thirties, whatever it might be, depending on your endeavor and who you are as a person you're trying to just give them the base stuff now that they know how to use and they can always go back to when it's time for them to use that later on in the process. And I think that that's kind of what we're hitting on here with like learning how to use a lot of physical training tools. Like you want to know how to do that before you, it's really time to use it, use it. If you've never bench pressed before, you should learn how to do it before you go try to three rep max, right? That that seems pretty logical. But there's so many climbers I've worked with, and I'll throw our uh, good friend Carrie Scott under the bus here, that like Carrie came to me at like 17 or 18 and had never bench pressed before, but she I watched her run quads on 12B the week before, right? So like that's pretty late in her climbing game to have never bench pressed before. So learning those skills before you really need them, I think is a really big theme that an intermediate climber should be aware of. Do you know how to use a hangboard? Do you know how to use the campus board? Can you bench press? Can you deadlift? Can you swing a kettlebell? Can you name the thing? You just want to be fluent in as many training climbing tools as possible. So when it's time to hammer them, you're fluent. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. What did I miss there, Will? I think, well... I might push back a little bit. I'm not, I, I don't know. I agree with all of that, but I think we should clarify it further because um, throwing that at people probably makes them feel overwhelmed with the amount of things that they could be spending their time on. That's where, a good point. you know, if we're talking about the strong but not good intermediate climber, a lot of their priorities should probably still be specifically within climbing movement skills, climbing strengths, that sort of stuff. Um, 
yeah, do you want to do you want to speak to that either of you? Like how to think about the balance of those two ideas? Uh, I'll I'll take a spin. Uh, yeah, I think. Uh, well, first uh, again, I think like every coach kind of in like our generation has had their mind blown by Steve Bechtel at least once. So I'm going <laughs> to steal from him again. Uh, Steve like he sat me down one day and was just like, "Hey, this is like roughly." I was asking him all these technical questions, and he was like, "That stuff doesn't matter." Drew just a circle and said three quarters of the time is rock climbing. The other 25% of the time is not rock climbing training stuff. So I think that that still holds true here. And that maybe can alleviate a large part of the stress here. So what I'm talking about is just trying to spend that 25% of the time that you're not rock climbing doing different things. You don't need to be mm. pigeonholed into like, these are the three exercises that I need to do all the time to get better at climbing. And if you did bench press and weighted pull-ups and a front squat for a month, and then the next time you come back around to your strength block, maybe pick different exercises mm. or learn how to do something different during your power mm. block or your endurance block. So that like throughout the course of a year and to Will's point, like in, in, in the intermediate time frame is a meaty one that can be a many years process for most people that that gives you a lot of time to differentiate what you're doing in that 25% part of your time wheel. Is that? Yeah. Cause I think you're right. Like I don't want what I'm saying to come off as like, I hear what you're saying about rock climbing, but like maybe you should bench press instead of rock climbing. <laughs> right. That's not what you're uh, saying. That, that's not where I'm coming at. Yeah. yeah. Like, but I, yeah, we don't, we don't want <laughs> no, that. That makes sense. Like you, it's not intermediate is not the time to be going like all in on Aiden Roberts shoulder rotation exercise. Like there's a lot of other things right. to be working on and developing that are a little bit more fundamental than that. Um, that's something you can yeah. be doing, but it's not time to hammer those very specific strengthening exercises. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You're, you're not trying to specialize in anything like doing weighted external rotations for your shoulder. Awesome. Like that's great. But it's not so it's not like I'm gonna program weighted external rotations every time I'm doing shoulder work for the next two years. You, like branch out. Like mm -hmm. if you're doing some overhead pressing, like maybe for one block, like Matt said, do it with a barbell. Next time, maybe with a dumbbell. Next time, maybe like work on some sort of like ring inversion thing or whatever. But like you're still doing the core stuff. Like we want to pull, we want to push, we want to do something with our trunk. Like we don't want to forget about our hips and our legs, um, you know, addressing the body in all the ways that you should, but not getting like overly constrained in your exercise selection. Um, like do some isometrics, do some eccentrics, do some like dynamic work, do, I like even adding in some isolation, but like doing dumbbell curls or versus something like more complex, like doing a pull up. But like Matt said, just getting fluent over a period of time. What I'm, what I'm not saying is like, just start throwing all of this stuff at the wall all at once. Move, move through it. There are progressions. And, and this is another thing that, that we, had talked about prior to recording this is um, there's a lot of good resources out there already as far as like exactly how to do a lot of this stuff. Like if you want to experiment with some isometric stuff, tons of great information out there about isometrics. You want to try some like gymnastics, more like calisthenic ring progressions, tons of great information out there. Um, and so I think this is maybe a good point in time for that climber to start experimenting with some of that and, and moving through all this. So by the time you're in a position, like Matt said, where it is time to like really start hammering this stuff, you actually have this like library of competence with all these different kinds of, of exercises, exercise selections, types of movements that when you get into the advanced air arena and you have a very specific problem that you're trying to solve, just like you've built up a toolbox on the wall movement wise, I now have a toolbox of like exercise selection and different interventions that 
I can look at the problem I'm dealing with and make good decisions about what tool I'm going to use to solve that. That's great. Yeah. Good, good uh, distinction and call out there to make there, Stephen. Can I throw in a tactical observation for intermediate climbers before we move totally. on? Hell yeah. Um, I thought of this, yeah. I thought of this, Will, when you were talking about your hip exercise. I really like that of having someone climb an entire boulder uh, open hipped versus hip in and seeing how those different types of movements feel on each move and comparing. Um, I, th I think I see this a lot with strong but not good intermediate climbers, but I think I see it with, it, it can be either. Um, just this is a very common intermediate thing is, you know, people by necessity start to pay more attention to the nuance of hard moves because they can't do them unless they pay attention to the nuance. They, they start paying attention to not just which hold do I grab with which hand, but how exactly do I take this hand hold? How exactly do I place the foot? All that sort of stuff. But I think what gets missed by a lot of intermediate climbers is they they forget to apply that across every difficulty level of move. They don't do that for the easier moves on the boulder or on the route. They don't re they don't rehearse the top out and make it as easy as it could be. Um, I see a lot of box checking, like oh the you know I'm trying this V8 and there's the crux down here and the top out's only V3, so I did it once. It felt not that hard and I never tried it again, you know, and then they finally get through the crux and then they fall off the top out. And it's like, well, yeah, you, you didn't do it well. You didn't have a good method. That's kind of a, you know, um, an extreme example to make my point, but I see that a lot and I think it gets, um, it can be a lot more subtle than that. And, you know, if you're trying like a 15 move boulder or a long route, um, with, um, you know, a few final bolts of climbing that are easier than the crux, but not that much easier. That's where it really becomes necessary to um, apply all that sort of detail thinking to all of the movements on the climb. Like, you know, go back and listen to my episode with Paul Robinson. He's one of the best boulders in the world. And he's saying that he always works things top down and he will refine a move over and over and over to make sure he's doing it the easiest way possible, even if it's V0, you know, even if it's dead easy for him, he will have done that move many times. And yeah, I see it happen a lot where like a reasonably strong climber who's reasonably skilled um, will just kind of burl their way through a top out or through, you know, like the final part of a, a route to get to the chains or something on their on their working burn and then think like, check that box, never have to try it again. Like I'll be fine, you know, but maybe, are you going to be, are you going to be fine? Like people shouldn't punt, yeah, you know, yeah. people shouldn't punt. People shouldn't fall off the easy part of climbs. That's so preventable. I mean, flukes happen, but like it, if it's a normal thing for you and if it happens semi-regularly, that's like definitely something to pay more attention to. Yeah. I mean, that's classic. And, and a really good point to bring up, I think it, it gets at a, a couple of different things. Um, for sure, there's uh, a tendency to, like you said, you there's a move that you feel like is hard and the rest are like, oh, well, I can just do that. Or the or a really classic, like I hear it all the time, someone, maybe they do even rehearse the top out, but it's like kind of ugly and you can tell that it's really not maybe the best way to do it. But they're like, I'm just going to get up there and I'm going to be psyched and that's going to get me through it. Yeah. Like, hopefully that is a <laughs> roll of the dice, my friend. Exactly. Like, I'm like, yeah. No, why, why gamble? There's that. no need to gamble that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And I, that can come from a number of different places, but I think the, one of the key points there is like, it could also just be like an e overall economy kind of a thing certainly as a climb gets longer. And when you talk to really good climbers, they're, they're constantly thinking about that. Sport climbers are like, there's a rest and it's not, oh, I rest at the rest. It's okay, given the next sequence, like I need gas in my right hand. So maybe I'll actually kind of cannibalize the energy in my left arm at this rest to get a little bit of extra back in my right so that I can make it through this next sequence, hit the next rest, then I can get it back in my left hand <laughs> or like totally. get in this crazy knee bar. That's not very good, but, and it's taking a ton of core, 
but I don't need core for the next section. I can get a little back in my arm. So there's actually like a more detailed energy usage and economy conversation happening internally or oftentimes externally between climbers as they're like working on something. Um, and the same applies for bouldering. Um, yeah. To, the other part of it is just take it all seriously. Like there's, yeah. If it respect, you can, it. you're still learning. Yeah. Respect it. You're still learning. Like you can learn, you're going to learn something by doing that top out better. And at the end of the day, spending more time dialing in the climb and then executing it like, well, that being kind of the goal, I think you're, you're just going to get more out of that experience. If you're really focused on just ticking the, like the box and the guidebook and be like, I did this climb. I think that's, that is also, a, that's a mindset that I think can lead people to doing what you described, which is just like, let me do the bare minimum that I can do to like scrape myself up this. And then it's climbing. Like you do get to check the box, mm -hmm. you know, like you did do it. It doesn't have to be pretty, but you know, is that actually going to help you moving forward? Is that going to help you do the next boulder you try? Is that going to help you do something more difficult? It's a, it's just kind of like a short, a short sighted view. Right. And I mean that what you just touched on is a skill too. And an important skill, like that becomes really important for like, trying to climb sport routes in two tries or three tries, you know, or trying to on-site, like in that instance, there is a skill of, okay, I don't need to find the best possible way to do the easy part of this route. I just need to find something that works. I know I can do it. And I know it's easy enough that it's not going to affect me when I get to the crux or, you know, vice versa. Um, that's a skill too. And, and that's a deep like self-awareness of knowing exactly how easy things need to be for you blah, 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 like that, that's a deep well of learning, but I'm, my point was more for projecting. I see that a lot with projecting. People just mm. neglect like easier parts of climbs and it's, and then it bites them, you know, or, or they get away with it, but like, it's, it's just so unnecessary. You can rehearse the top out a couple times as the final part of your warm up, you know, and, um, you can do it in a way where it's not taking away from your skin or taking away from your red point tries or whatever, you know, finish the session by doing the top out a couple times or something. Um, yeah, especially on a rope, like people just get lazy. I think when they're sport climbing and don't want to go to the, the, the chain. Yeah. Too many moves yeah. or I don't know. Um, yeah. Anyway, it's preventable stuff. Just. Yeah. I mean, punch. talking about backfilling too, like the, the, the more you engage, like, as we've been talking through this, the more you engage with these levels as you move along and, and focus on the kind of breadth of learning rather than like really going, getting kind of over specialized early on, uh, will give you more tools to interact productively with what you're talking about. Like when you get to that point in your projecting, like you, Ideally, by that point, you have some level of experience and competence with a lot of different kinds of climbing and top outs being something that really it takes experience doing it before you really understand kind of the mechanics of it. And if you've never done that before, uh, that's an intimidating thing when you go out in your project and you're working on something and you're like, man, I really... In your, those people know, <laughs> like in their head, like I, it would probably help if I did it again, but often I, I hear this a lot. They're like, I don't want to have to do it again. I just want to do it one more time and have that be the time that I send when really like you need to, you need to learn that thing. And the better you learn it, the more you'll be in a position in the future where you can be like, oh, the top out, I got that. Mm -hmm. Like I, I don't need to run it five times before I get send attempts. Mm -hmm. I think just to like pull apart a few things you guys have said here is that uh, we can kind of compartmentalize a bunch of the things you guys are talking about into practice training and performance, right? We're like, if, if you mm -hmm. know you're that guy who you're a serial punter, you get up to the top of boulders and then <laughs> you stink at mantling. I think, let me back up. 
intermediate climbers get psyched. This whole new world of climbing has just opened up for them. They're learning new skills. They're probably getting a little bit better. Maybe they're climbing outside some more. Who knows what it might be? They have their crew, all that good stuff. So they get into this, they're always performing cycle. You're always trying to like climb as hard as you can, particularly when you're outside and maybe that's something you don't get to do very often. It's not super motivating to be like, hey, you should go mantle. Like you're just going to mantle today. You're going to climb up that V1 or V2 and do 27 top outs today. That's it, right? Like, but that might be what you need. That's really different than trying to climb your hardest on a day. So I think um, the intermediate climbers I see have success are really good at separating out the times when it's time to perform. It doesn't matter how you do something and it's just like be scrappy, get up the wall versus I'm trying to get better at this specific thing today. Whether that's in the gym or on the wall is irrelevant, but they, they don't coexist very well. Mm. And I think that gets muddled a little bit. Um, and in, in separating them allows you to not get so frustrated with yourself because your expectations for a given day are really different. Does that make any sense? Yeah, that's great. Okay. Where are we? We need to re ground ourselves in, in this, uh, outline we've got here. So we've been talking this whole time about intermediate climbers. Um, did we make our way through strong, not good? And do we need to talk specifically about the good, not strong climber for this category? I think we covered our strong, not good. We went through the drills there. I think maybe we didn't touch too much on the good, not strong. Yeah. Will, do you want to take that away? I think the, sure. Yeah. The, I want to start kind of with the goal here because I think we've touched on on the issues themselves. But this is, we said earlier, like this is the sort of welcome to climbing moment. It doesn't, nothing gets easier from here. It only gets harder and it's going to get harder and harder to hide, um, especially for the, I find like the the good, not strong person. Um, you're You're going to have to get stronger. And or, or, or your progression is going to really slow down. Um, I learned this the hard way for sure over the years. Uh, and a lot of this has to do with like, I don't know, Matt, Matt uses the terms like getting the reps in. And I think this is a great, <clears throat> a great position for the, the intermediate climber to be in. Like if you're, if you're not great at climbing on like quote unquote strong boulders in steep terrain, start focusing on that. Um, don't, don't let that slide. Um, to what Matt just said about the, you know, separating practice from performance, it can get pretty demotivating if you're like, okay, all I'm going to do is go into the gym get my reps in on steep terrain and not really get to do any of the fun stuff that I'm like successful at or good at. Um, the way that I sort of handle this for, for myself, uh, is I like eat my vegetables first and <laughs> like do, do the climbing that I like, I know that I need to do like, because I objectively understand that it's going to help me. Um, but it's, it's usually not as fun for me. And then I sort of dangle the carrot at the end of the session where it's like, and then you get to go like mess around on this, like a ret or slab and do fun stuff. Um, but getting the vegetables in first, um, is, is something that I've sort of found to be helpful. And honestly, that works for the, you know, our strong, not good climber as well. Um, so but I'd say it's a little almost set up better for this good, not strong person where like you're doing the physically mm -hmm. taxing thing first. Whereas like maybe if slabs your game, you, your arms can feel like jelly, but you're still going to be able to go climb mm -hmm. a bunch of the slab boulders that you want to climb. So it's really set up perfect for this person to go ahead and eat your vegetables first and do the stuff that's not as motivating to you, but real taxings. Like it, it really doesn't take much for this person either, right? Like that could be 20, 30 minutes of, 
just like, all right, I'm just going to climb on steep, chuggy stuff and be really powerful about it. And then I can go spend the rest of my session having fun doing my slabby stuff. And, you know, you, you, you're still going to get the gains that you need and the stuff you stink at. That's a really good point. It's kind of flip flopped to like for the strong, not good. It's almost like do rip around on the wall and get tired Mm -hmm. so that you can't actually just crank through like a more technical set of boulders later on kind of flipping that depending on where you lie on the spectrum there. Cool. What are we missing here? I'm checking my notes. Yeah. Um, I mean, this, this is, uh, this person that, that again, still just 25%, but you're going to want to be strength training, even if you don't want to be strength training, (laughs) that's the case may be, uh, or, and, and to your great point earlier on, Steven, like the, the kind of climbing you're doing can also tick a lot of those boxes too. So uh, if you really just can't bring yourself to get into the gym and do the pull-ups and whatever else, uh, you can diversify your climbing to a point where you can get a lot of the same input just from climbing. Um, but it, it can be harder to do, especially depending on what you have access to the route setting at your gym, whether they even have wall angles like that and so on. Yeah, Totally. Will, in our talks about that, you, you know, this was an experience you had as a climber, talked a lot about like how, how you started to program your vegetables <laughs> at this point mm-hmm. in your climbing journey. Uh, what vegetables are best for you? How many vegetables is enough vegetables? So in, in to unvegetable, <laughs> this analogy is uh, like, what stuff is important to you off the wall? And how are you starting to use them i guess in your so you're talking your about hopes of a, accomplishing advanced status in the not so distant okay. future uh i may be answering a different question but i'm going to give it a whirl Do uh, it. <laughs> so it it can be really easy to get in over your head at this point movement wise and on it and get hurt honestly um and something that i as a more good, not strong person, something I've found really helpful um, because I have injured, I've subluxed my shoulder twice in four years, had to have two surgeries, um, total mess. And the the issue was I was, I was trying to climb in a way that my body couldn't handle. And so like, it's all well and good to be like, okay, yes, you can climb in a way that will give you these adaptations, but you can run into situations where you're truly just not physically prepared to jump to a gas stone over your head in a roof. And the the way to get from not being able to do that to being able to do that isn't trying to jump to the gas stone in the roof over your head 10 times a session every week. Like, just trying to have that outcome by exposing yourself to it over and over again. This is often a thing where I'll take those situations and use them to kind of inform what's happening off the wall. Like if I'm working on a climb uh, or am just noticing that like, I don't have the, I don't feel like I have the shoulder to like take these gas stones really wide or to like actually get these lock offs deep enough to do the kinds of moves that I'm trying to do. I'm like, all right, so like what's happening physically here? Like I need to build strength and resiliency in my shoulders so that when I go to practice these movements on the wall, I'm bringing like the, the requisite tissue to that scenario and then can teach it to do these climbing movements that I want them like want to be able to do. Um, and is that kind of what you're talking about, Matt? Like, yeah, that's a hundred percent. Thank you for being able to decipher the jibber jabber that okay, came out cool. of my question. Cool, there. Cool. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. And, and this is, this can, the goal setting part of this, I think is really important along with like the self-assessment of where am I at? Um, especially for the, the good, not strong. Like if I want to 
climb a boulder that has a certain kind of move or want to develop a competency in a certain style, I may be in a position to understand technically how that's happening and in some ways actually be able to replicate it. But I might not have the tissue to to actually, you know, we talked about this kind of skill facilitating, strength facilitating skill. I am in a point where like I, I have the skill, but I don't have the strength required to execute on that skill in the way that I want to do it. And that can be addressed by kind of building movement progressions on the wall. Um, like say my target move is this really wide gas stone that I want to move dynamically into. This is where, uh, boards, system boards really shine or spray walls for that matter. I can set a similar move that's just kind of scaled back and then maybe set a couple of moves where over time I'm like, as I get strong and feel stable in this position, I can make it a little bit harder and then learn that and then make it a little bit harder all the while kind of moving towards this target movement that I want. And I can also, uh, that can go hand in hand with what I'm doing off the wall, right? Like if what I need is more shoulder, like I can select exercises that are going to help me build that. And so I'm kind of hitting it from both ends and I'm able to build towards whatever that goal is. Um, and I think that's, that's a really important carryover, like something that I feel like you, it's really nice to learn as an intermediate climber because it gets really pronounced as an advanced climber, like being able to understand like that I want to do a thing, whatever that is, whatever goal it is that I have understanding how that needs to be done like why I may or may not be able to do it and then how to take that information and come up with interventions that will help me get from where I'm at to where I want to go. Yeah. Cause like, which is always like, well, sure. Of course. Like that's the whole thing. Uh, yeah. But no, that that's good. Like <laughs> that's training right? the yeah. reverse, the reverse yeah. engineering and then being able to look at your own climbing and your own body and your physicality and say like, what preparation do I need to do? you know, at the baseline to be able to take the next step towards that goal, to take the next step, to actually be able to stick that move, to actually be able to link through that move, to be able to send the boulder, whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. That, reverse yeah, engineering is a good term to use for it. I think, uh, and that comes back to like two, like the bigger themes that we're trying to get at from an intermediate climber is like asking them to be more intentional with everything that they're doing, right? Like, and ask why. Why are you doing something and how can you be intentional to achieve the answer to that? Why? Uh, and just like a quick, a common pitfall. I see a lot of people slide into, uh, where, you know, I'll, I'll name names for a second point fingers. Chris Sharma did so many wonderful things for the sport, but I think that this is something that maybe his success was not helpful to the climbing masses on the whole where he was famous for, oh, I can't do that route. So I'm going to throw myself at it with a martyr like commitment until he does the thing. So you're like, cool. Like if that works for him, that's going to work for me. Right. Again, maybe, ho hopefully that would be really cool if it did. But like at a certain point, there's going to be stuff where that doesn't happen. You have to do the reverse engineering process that you guys just described. It happens from like a technical standpoint too. Um, mm, good point. Uh, this is this is a something that Quinn is working on right now. So technically, he has an understanding of like, okay, in this position, I want to, I need to be able to articulate my body like this, like turn my hip in or or uh, get my heel up to this like high foothold or something. So he understands it technically that that that's what he needs to do, but he doesn't have the flexibility or the mobility, depending on how you want to talk about that. His his body can't actually do the thing that he knows that he needs to do. And so he'll just overpower it. And he has a lot of he's built a lot of self-awareness and understands where he's like, I did do it, but that wasn't it. Hmm. And I know what I need to do, but I don't I'm like physically incapable of doing it. So reverse engineering from that, like 
how does that person like say I need more hip mobility? Like that person needs to train flexibility and range strength. Like they need to actually be able to manipulate their body to accomplish that technique. And that's going to amplify the strength that they already have. Uh, so climbing is one of those things I, this is a tangent that I won't go on, but like being able to be in the position is critical. If you're a little outside of it, it gets exponentially harder and takes exponentially more physical input. And so like flexibility and climbing, I, I know the kind of training sphere waffles on how important training flexibility is. Um, but it's important. Um, you, you need to be able to occupy these positions and then be able to like express strength in them in order to actually climb well. And so if you're on that, I'm really strong, but not very flexible side, truly investing in improving your flexibility and your mobility is going to go really far. And if you're on the side where I am really flexible and I am really mobile, but when I get into these positions, I cannot produce the force necessary. Focusing on that strength is going to really pay off. And awesome. Reverse engineering is a great way to figure out the how to actually address those things. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. I'm noticing, um, you know, again, in this conversation, we're not giving any prescriptions. We're not telling people whether they should spend more time, you know, bench pressing versus doing shoulder press or spend more time on a tension board versus, a, you know, the beast spray wall or whatever else. We're not telling people what to do. Um, and I, I, there was a time in my climbing where I would have been frustrated by that because I really wanted guidance. But what I hadn't learned to do yet was this process. And this process kind of changes everything. It, it helps the person guide themselves towards what they should be spending their time doing. It's that process of identifying like, who am I as a climber? Where am I going with my climbing? What do I want to get better at? What am I trying to get better at? What is it that I, why am I training in the first place? Like, what is it that I want to be able to do that I can't yet do? And then um, kind of iterating, you know, with with this knowledge, with this self-awareness of um, this reverse engineering process and what that gives you. It's like, okay, because this type of move is hard for me and it demands this of my shoulder or my fingers or whatever, or my flexibility, um, like this is the limiting factor for me. And let's let's go to all these resources that are available and try to figure out you know, a way to actually work towards that. And that might change over time. Like you might have to go back to basic stretching protocols before you work towards like on the wall drills to, to work on heel hooking or whatever. Maybe you can do both at the same time, but, um, but yeah, so I love that you guys are taking this kind of 3000 foot view and focusing on areas of focus for people so that they can find that path for themselves on their own or with the help of a, you know, a crew or, or a coach or, or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's I mean, a great summary. Yeah. Thank you for saying that. I think, you know, we maybe should have led with this, but like our hope here is we're trying not to be like copping out by not giving people prescriptions, but, uh, Steven, you said it in a past episode where you've learned in your own climbing journey to focus less on the specifics and more on the principles. Uh, I can't remember where you said you learned that, but uh, I think what we're trying to give people here is like an illustration of the process that you need to go through in order to like recognize something, acquire something, and then gain mastery over that thing. And that thing could be anything, right? Crimping, pinching, heel hooks, mobility, flexibility, bench press, you name it, right? But that process stays the same. And you might be a beginner, an intermediate, advanced, or whatever in a bunch of different things all at the same time. So our goal, I think, is to give people like you know, the tools to identify where you're at on that continuum of whatever that skill might be and how to go through the process so that once you get the process, it gets more fluid and quicker every time so that when you do, you've gone through it a few times and now you've identified something else that you would like to become really good at 
it happens way quicker than the first couple times. And you can avoid all the growing pains that uh, Will and I have gone through as well as countless <laughs> other rock climbers. <laughs> Me, yeah. Yeah. yeah if, maybe if everyone who rock climbs. If you understand the goal and you understand the process, it actually becomes very, like quite easy to pick the exercise or the intervention. And I think too often people will come at it from the exercise and intervention side and, and then it doesn't work. And then they wonder why it doesn't work. And it's like, well, you just, you're going about the whole thing backwards. Mm -hmm. So if you start with the goal and then understand the process, the rest of the, it will more easily fall into place and you'll be able to kind of, you know, you're scrolling Instagram and you see the new shiny thing that people are doing. And you're like, you have the immediate reactions like, Oh, that looks fun. But you're like, wait a second. Like, does it align with my goals? Like, will it, does it fit into this process of that? Like I'm currently working on to like address this thing in my climbing. And if not, it's like, all right, like, that's cool. Maybe save that for later, but like moving on. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah. Maybe not even it, that looks fun. I mean, you know, training does look fun, but for me, I wonder if people can relate to this because I'm such a like, um, I don't know because I have the engineer background and stuff. And I was obsessed with the question of like, what's the best way to get better for so long. I would see stuff like that pop up and think, am I blowing it by not doing that? Like, Oh fuck. Here's another thing that I have to add mm -hmm. to my list. Here's another thing that I have to at least like investigate to see if it's, if it's better than what I'm currently doing. And it's like, that's just completely unhelpful. And, and now I am closer to what you're describing where I can see you know, or, or do an interview with someone who has a different way of training than me or a different way of training than, than something I've been exposed to in the past. And it's compelling on its own, right. It's interesting. Um, and I can take that and look at it through the lens of, um, you know, does it fit me and my goals and where I'm at? Um, does it fit my lifestyle? Like those are really important filters to look through. And if those, if one of those answers is no, then it's like, cool, I'll, I'll set it over here in this box of like someday, maybe, you know, like this is like a great mm -hmm. thing that I'm not forgetting about. I'm, I'm, you know, you can use a notes app or whatever works for you, but don't lose it. If you think that it's compelling, maybe you'll return to it, but it's a not right now sort of thing. And, um, yeah, yeah, there, there's just, I mean, we really can only do so much at any given time and that's totally fine. That's actually a good thing. And, um, just because you're focusing on a different style of training now, doesn't mean that, um, you know, you, you might, you might kind of max that out or learn what you, you might get what you needed from the type of training that you're doing now and, and open yourself up to something different in the future. So yeah, that alleviates a lot of yeah. the stress. I used to feel a lot of overwhelm from just like collecting information and not really knowing how to do it all. <laughs> Cause <laughs> of course you can't. Yeah. You can't. Yeah. I think you hit a couple of really interesting things. If you don't mind me adding on that, like, well, yeah. number one, like Will and I talk about that optimal doesn't exist. Like maybe theoretically the perfect training plan and nutrition plan is out there, but no human could ever possibly hope to actually execute that. Right. Like professional athletes, like the LeBron James of the world have a whole team of people around them trying to control every little nook and cranny of their life. And they still don't pull it off. So like that doesn't even exist in rock climbing. So what hope do we have? Right. So yeah. that's not going to happen. Uh, it, but not to throw a wrench completely the other direction here that like, we're talking about all like, you know, the best ways to spend your time. But if we're going under the assumption that optimal doesn't exist, like I, I'm a big proponent of having fun while you're doing this also. So if you do see that thing on the Instagrams that you're sliding through and you're like, Oh, that looks sick yes, go through that process of like, is this the thing that I need? And if your answer is no, but it still looks really sick to you, give it a whirl, right? Like I, yeah. it didn't kill me that I did that Paul Robinson hangboard workout for a little while. I realized after doing it for two weeks, I couldn't move my arm. So it probably wasn't like the right thing for me at the time, but I had fun doing it. It was an interesting challenge to take on. I learned some stuff. I got to throw it into a podcast 12 years later now or something like that. But you know, like <laughs> if something looks fun to you, assuming that it's not dangerous, I don't want to have the trainers of the world get really mad at me for saying this, but like, just try some stuff. That's okay. But also, mm. uh, know that it may not be the best way for you. 
No, that's that's a great point. I think that's super important. Um, and and those things can coexist absolutely. Like right now, I'm in a phase where I'm really into OTGs. You know, the mat folds, like mm-hmm. lifting weight off the ground for reps with a with like some sort of hangboard implement, right? Like the tension block or or whatever else. Um, I don't think it's better than max hangs. I don't think it's the new secret sauce to getting your fingers stronger. I just think it feels cool. I just like it, you know, I, and I need, I, I want to keep working on my finger strength. And that is, um, an element, one of the elements of, um, of my climbing that I want to work on to go from where I'm at to where I want to go. This is a way to do it. There's lots of ways to do it. And I'm, I'm doing it. I've kind of pivoted to it. Yeah. Again, not because it's the best thing out there, but just cause I saw it and I saw Matt doing it and I tried it and I was like, I feel like a badass when I do this. I like counting reps yeah. instead of counting seconds. I don't know why, just my brain likes that for some reason. I can kind of program it similar to my weight training and, and that's working for me. So um, yeah, a lot of this stuff, it's like there's lots of different things that can lead you you know, towards your goal. Pick the one that you like. Don't overthink it too much. Absolutely. All yeah. right. I mean, that's that's awesome. I think that fully just kind of segues us into advanced because i think this the this like optimization problem is really where i think the it is one of the biggest stumbling blocks for the advanced climber because at this point you've been climbing for a good handful of years you've you've done some training right like we talked about in the uh intermediate ideally you've built up some sort of a toolbox of different off the wall interventions on the wall interventions. So you're, you're getting pretty trained. Like you've, you've been exposed to a lot of this different stimulus and you've probably felt like your, your ability is improving, but the improvement starts to slow down naturally. And this is a trap that I've fallen into a lot. And like, even now, like I, I know, but it'll still, things will still hit me away and I'll be like, Ooh, maybe, but that like, just like the like game changer, boom. Like I just like leveled up in six weeks kind of a thing. It's kind of off the table. Like that stuff doesn't really happen anymore mm. for a trained athlete. And you so, still really want it to exist this, and you still get very excited when you think you come across it, but it's just totally so yeah. you see a new thing and you're like, Oh shit, maybe this is it. Like this is going to do it for me. And you try yeah. it and then it, it doesn't work. <laughs> it's just that kind of thing doesn't happen anymore. And so really what's happening or, or what ideally what's happening instead of trying like zoning in too much on this optimum, what we really want to do is start refining, refining all the things that we've been kind of exploring and learning as an intermediate climber and dialing that kind of stuff in and being able to really focus it uh, in a very specific way, um, which is kind of a skip ahead towards like the intervention. Um, but the the issue that or one of the issues that I feel like the advanced climber comes up against is the goals need to get more and more specific. So your understanding of what's going on has to get more and more nuanced in order to like understand what those specific goals are. And then again, reverse engineer and understand what kind of interventions are actually going to apply to that goal. Mm Mm-hmm. And I think to go back to our bandwidth theme that we've brought up a few times is that like you've learned to be analytical and to parse out what, what went wrong, how to address it, all that kind of stuff. And what an advanced climber needs to be doing is have all that happen more accurately and faster. And I think this for sure happens in your like outdoor climber and regular gym climber as well. But you can really see it under the microscope and the comp environment where every time an athlete does not get to the top, they have to go through that process really, really, really quickly through a, like a bunch of different variables. Um, and all we see as like 
observers is they fell, they chalked, they rested, and then they sent the boulder. Where really what's happening in their head is they're asking all the questions that we just talked about in the intermediate scenario about like, why did that happen? What do I need to do differently? What if this, what if that times a thousand all happening while they're chalking up their hands for 30 seconds and then they get up and make adjustments. If it didn't work, then they go through that process again and again and again and again. But they're like a supercomputer at this point, right? Like they can just run so many scenarios so quickly that all we see is chalking and resting. Mm. But that's not what's happening internally. So, um, you know, I, I think to reuse Will's word of refinement here that you've got the stuff you need once you've gotten to this area in your climbing journey. It's about being able to like utilize those things better and knowing what to do when faster in our opinion. Yeah. Yeah, It's a tricky one though. Definitely not easy to do. Mm -hmm. Right. Like in my head, this is going from like dial up to fiber optics. (laughs) (laughs) Right. (laughs) Yeah. Like that, that costs something, you know? Right. There's like, hopefully you built the infrastructure at some point that like you're not first trying to dig a hole from the street to your house at this point, but like (laughs) things, things are going to get quicker here. And then once you have the fiber optic system going, you can do a whole bunch of cool shit with it. And I think that's really where like advanced climbing starts to manifest itself. Will, do you want to, uh, take us through the first strong, not good advanced climber? Yeah, I think I, I want to, cause we have a wanna... nice little thing here where yeah, yeah. the strong, not good, good, not strong is kind of an inversion of the same idea. Mm. Um, for the strong, not good, like working hard got you here, but now you need to be smart. And on the flip side for the good, not strong, like being smart got you here and now it's time to work hard. Mm. Uh, so that that flip there, I think is a, is another interesting thing, depending on kind of where you end up on the spectrum as you arrive at that advanced level. I like so that to, to, to drill, to drill a little deeper for the, the strong, not good. I, I mentioned, uh, Quinn earlier, throwing him under the bus a little bit. He won't mind. Uh, Quinn's one of your like tension, lack of, uh, yeah, Quinn's buddies for he he works at tension. Yeah. Um, and he's brutally strong. Like it's it's crazy. Like he could just be climbing V14. Like if he sets the boulder, like it could be any grade. And he'll like <laughs> do it quickly and no one can touch it. It's it's one of those things. But as soon as the climb requires access to a position that he's unable to get into all that strength goes out the window. Mm. And I think that that's really where like in order for an athlete at this level to progress, uh, and they are really strong. Usually the issue is that they lack an understanding of the positions that they need to occupy or lack the, like, or they understand that, but lack the ability to actually occupy the position. Because once they can get there, the the strength is already accounted for. Like Mm -hmm. the ability to produce force is usually accounted for, but the ability to know what to do with it, I find is less. Matt, you're making a face. Yeah. Can I push you on this a little bit? Please. Please. Expand on what you mean by occupy position. Okay. So to to continue my my, uh, Quinn... (laughs) <laughs> yeah, sorry, Quinn. <laughs> under throwing. Sorry, Quinn. Um and, and to and to kind of piggyback off this earlier concept of like if you're not in the position, it's exponentially harder. So there's not like an infinite amount of like strength you can gain. Do we agree on, on that point? Yeah. Like it gets like you're you're sure. you're up against this kind of diminishing returns zone, right? You're not gonna get like I I was talking to you earlier, Matt, it was like, there was one point where I just like put 40 pounds on my, on my finger strength in like eight to 10 weeks or something like that. It was when I first started hangboarding, <laughs> like right. I, that's not going to, ha- that's not going to happen to me again. You know, like that would be sick, 
but it's just not, that's not how that works. So you take somebody like Quinn, who's very strong, like he can get stronger, but he's not going to get way stronger. Right. So if he's out of these positions, there's like, there's a cap to his strength and there's only so much out of the position that he can feasibly be before the move is just not possible. And so what I mean by like occupying the position, it has to do with that relationship where like, if you're in the position, the strength requisite goes down. And if you're out of the position, it goes up exponentially. And if you're not in a position where you can pile on a level of strength that would allow you to be out of that position, the only dial you can turn is occupying the position. So like doing a complex move, the air quotes right way is, is mm. what you're talking about. Getting your body in the sure, correct position like, for the move. Yeah. This is like, we often talk about like the box in climbing. And this is like directly related to that. Um, like, and you see it a lot in comp climbing for sure. Um, and a lot in outdoor climbing, a little bit less, like this is one of the things that I think is the most difficult to replicate on a board. And where I think uh, like really strong board climbers can can hide from having to work on this by just cranking on flat pieces of plywood. But when you introduce a level of like dimensionality to this scenario where you kind of need to be like inside two holds or like occupying, like when the wall like curves in or if it curves out and the way that you're positioned in space relative to those holds becomes really consequential. Mm -hmm. um, that's where I see this like really rear its head for the really strong climbers who don't have like the technical experience or the mobility or the flexibility to manipulate space in that way. Gotcha. I think that's, so would it be fair to sum that up and like kind of to pull out of the things we brought into from the beginner section of this meat suit competence, but on steroids? <laughs> Yeah, like like we like I said, coming back to that word refined, like it it has to get refined. And those what happens here is those boxes get smaller, right? Like the margin for error gets smaller. Mm. Where on for for a less experienced climber on an easier boulder problem, the kind of the the space in the air could like that range could be like a foot. Your hips could be a foot one way versus the other way. And realistically, you're still basically in the position and it's still basically going to work. The harder and harder that climbing gets, the narrower that like band of space gets. Where if you're a little bit out or your foot's a, on the foothold, just a little wrong so that like your, your heel, like that lever is in a wrong spot and you're half an inch too far away from the wall it just doesn't go and then all that's often one of those things like where you see climbers like making progress on hard boulders where they'll get on the like try and hold the position or get someone to push them in and like they're trying to like find where exactly that is and you have an entire body to articulate to try and find what that position is and learn it and then be able to move in and out of it and remember it and all that other stuff. But that for me is like the, the thing for people who are really strong, but seem to underperform when they're either in a comp or go rock climbing. It's usually that, that is the problem. Mm -hmm. It's like a level totally of nuance great. that's being missed around body positions and, and exactly how to do moves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That makes sense. I think this is and where like the, the mobility dialogue comes back into play here where will you i think you put it well like you know we throw around like the words flexibility mobility and we don't have to go all the way down like if you've if anybody's ever worked with me before you know that's a a ride i can ride for a long time mobility is a, a big thing for me but uh in general at this point like you you are a strong athlete if you're an advanced strong not good but how many diverse ways can you be strong is really the question you need to be asking yourself, I think, of like, 
cool, you're strong from here to here. Maybe you're V14 from here to here. But if I take your arm out here and you're only V8, okay, cool. We just found like your lowest hanging fruit, right? Like now, now that's like an area in which you need to train. That's an easy thing for this person to start identifying to. Um, does that feel like an accurate summation there? Yeah, and I think I'd I'd expand it a little bit too, based on what we've talked about in the intermediate, where like you're really exploring. Like the goal of that exploration in the intermediate area is to kind of give you like an internal language around sensation. Mm, and sure. if you've if you've kind of shortcutted that through kind of the through that intermediate zone, you can end up in like an advanced arena where you're asking your your you may not know it but you're asking your body to do something that it's not done before and you don't have experience being in those positions and when you've not been there before it becomes really difficult to like even talk about and that's sort of where like when i a way you can address this is like getting pushed into a move on a boulder problem or something like that. Or um, something that I do a lot is I'll like pull on the wall. It, it, if I'm trying to learn a position, I'll pull on and I'll try and stay there as long as I can. And what I'll find starts to happen is like little parts of me will kind of start fatiguing and my position will slowly start shifting as like I fatigue. And as I'm doing that, I'm learning things like about what my joints are doing in space and like how the holds start to kind of change their feeling, whether it's the foot or the hands. And, and in, in some instances it might look like I'm not moving at all, but it's just slow stuff. And I'm learning like what to flex and what that feels like. Um, and trying to like internalize some of the physical cues I'm feeling, um, at least that's kind of how it feels to me. I don't know. Y'all might be, be different, um, but th that might be totally off the wall, but that's kind of how I do it. Uh, if I'm trying to like learn something that I don't understand uh, it, in the context of like a climbing position. Yeah. I think to me, that's like a, a really good way of identifying what it is that you need. And then I think it still comes back to like, the thing we talked about ahead of time, Will, is like training through a greater range of motion and acquiring strength where you don't currently have it, right? And like, mm -hmm. you know, maybe it either takes one or two forms, I suppose. Like one is like, oh, cool, this is the position I need to occupy and I cannot, right? Like I, I need to change. I need to acquire those strength capacities that will allow me to acquire that position. Or now that I'm in this position and I'm starting to fatigue, maybe I found a more economical way to, to occupy this position than I thought was the only way before I got up here. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think it's, I'm hearing mm -hmm. both of those things. It's like, yeah, sometimes yeah. this process helps you identify movement, you know, limitations or, or mobility limitations or things. And that's a guiding light, something to work on. But it's also just a process of having more nuance around exactly how your body feels in a position or in a move and realizing like you might have plenty of mobility to do it a slightly better way. You just haven't explored it yet. So let's start to explore um, those different sensations. Totally. That's interesting. I feel like I'm, I wonder if you're the same way, Will, like hearing you describe that. I, I feel like this is something I haven't ever thought about very much because I think I'm very intuitively a sensory based climber. I think I just like really notice this, the feeling of positions and when something feels right, it, it clicks and I remember it and it might shift over time. Like maybe as I start to build a little strength in that position, I can do it a slightly more economical way or a way that sets me up better for the next move or whatever. But, um, but yeah, I've, I've, I think for a long time, um, I didn't appreciate that that wasn't as intuitive for other climbers, you know, cause of course we're all different. And so, um, I think I have a strong, uh, whatever that is like connection to kind of that, I don't know, in my body kind of sensory thing and, and some people learn differently. So it's definitely a time to like start exploring that more. Yeah. I don't for know. If sure. I'm, I mean, it's I'm, something I'm not saying that... anything profound here. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no, I, that's, that's great. I, and that's 
like you said, people are wired different. And for some people that comes really naturally. And for some people that concept is super foreign and, you know, why ever that's the case, <laughs> uh, doesn't necessarily matter. Like the, like for you, if, if that kind of sensory information, like that just feels really natural to you and that's how you operate and you don't, aren't like intellectualizing it, that's okay. Like for you potentially over intellectualizing it could have negative repercussions. Mm. Um, at least my perspective on it is like, the goal is to get is to get yourself to a place where you are operating in what I call like feeling mode. That, that to me is what feels like mastery. I don't have to think about it. I don't have to intellectualize it. Like the Bruce Lee, like when it's time, I don't hit, it hits all by itself. Like it just happens. And I think the more you uh, can like, either whether and whether this is like a very conscious purposeful thing but like the more you can get towards feeling i think the the more the closer you're getting to that mastery component but like with everything else there is kind of like the opposite side of the coin as well where uh you can leave some stones unturned you know like it's it's tough to understand if you're operating purely on feeling when there may be other options mm -hmm. open. Um, and so I think there's always kind of a tension back and forth between those two things. Um, like, I, I, I think this is a pretty common thing. I certainly for me where, and I remember when I first kind of started to land on this and be like, Holy shit, it's crazy how I can take a hold like a half a pad different and the move feels completely different. So like I'll be, I will have been trying a project over and over or taking a hold the same way. And I am having that kind of sensory experience and it feels fine. It just feels really hard, but sometimes it'll take like a moment of stepping away from that and, and kind of turning the analytic mind on for a second and looking at the hold and being like, based on what I'm feeling, like, is there a dial to turn here? Like if I take the dimple with my ring finger instead of my middle finger, like there's a, there's a pretty complex feedback that happens with those sorts of micro beta. Like as soon as my hand changes position, my wrist is in a different place, which then changes like where my arm can be. And then that changes like where my trunk, like a very small change in the hand can completely open up a whole new realm uh, given a specific move. And so being able to kind of go back and forth between those things, I I've found helpful, but you know, that is kind of just a, a me anecdote. Uh, I don't think it is a you anecdote. If I might be so bold, I think, uh, yeah, I, yeah, I think I agree. Well, well, this is something, uh, I threw at you not long ago and that I think resonated with you that there's a study done in biomechanics and kinematics where they study how, I think the study was done on golfers, if I'm remembering correctly, where they take a bunch of shitty golfers, people who have basically never golfed, and a bunch of elite high-level golfers. Maybe they're, I don't know what their handicap is. I don't even really know what a handicap is. They're good golfers. <laughs> so, and they put a bunch of like uh, EMG stickies on them to see like what, muscles are turning on when right so they're trying to figure out like the hypothesis is that the elite golfers are going to be able to recreate the same sequence of muscle activation more consistently than the novice golfers but what they found was exactly the opposite that the more elite golfers have almost they have way more variability in their kinematics in terms of what sequence of muscle activation happens in a given task huh. which is really interesting to me that and, and it shows a couple different things that like number one they just have more degrees uh, more margin for error and more degrees of freedom so if it's me golfing i'm really shitty i've only played like two rounds of golf in my whole life i have to have everything go absolutely perfect and 
within a very fine range for me to accomplish the outcome I'm looking for to have it basically like not go into the trees or into a lake or something, right? Versus the Tiger Woodses of the world who can have a whole bunch of different shit happen. Things can go wrong along the way and they can still have a positive outcome. Which like upon first reading, I was like, how the hell is that possible, right? It's like, it seems so counterintuitive. It seems like they would be recreating the same set of kinematics over and over and over again. Um, And I think that that, portrays really like, or relates very closely to what you're articulating here, Will, and that like the, the feeling that you have is kind of all that matters. Like if you're a coach, you're familiar with external and internal cueing, right? We're telling somebody what feeling they should have is not really the way to convey that information. And this study backs that up, right? There is no feeling that you should have it's because it's yours and it's probably going to change every time you get on the wall too right uh so long long little bit tangential thing but i think is really interesting uh and i think alleviates a little bit of pressure in trying to get ourselves or athletes that we work with to do it the right way like oh well your hip has to do this then your body does this then this is this well maybe right but the better you are the less that becomes true Sorry, yeah, nerd tangent. I, I, I think that's great. I mean, it's it's it, again. I feel like all, almost everything. Like, I want to just bring it back to the intermediate climber because that is really the chunk where you have an opportunity to do a lot of stuff really right mm. as far as the way you go about it. But you also have like a a lot of opportunity to do it. You know, I think what we would consider the incorrect way. And I think this is where a lot of my beef with the strength metric stuff comes from, because it's it's one of those things that is it seems really easily digestible, easily trackable, easy to train for, easy to like move the needle on. And but what it really comes down to is, I think, at least in my opinion, like the breadth of experience, because what I sort of feel like when if if you're if you're leaning into the strength metrics at the expense of what you're doing with your climbing what you're exposing yourself to um it's almost like you're you're just sharpening that one firing pattern to to use your analogy with the golfers like mm. you're yeah you're 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 creating a scenario where if you're perfect you're crushing But if you're anything but perfect, you're done. And the way that the real world usually works and the way that like, you know, or at least my experience with, with, with climbing and rock climbing, especially is that that is super rare. And what actually results in more successful outcomes is having more like having more opportunity to be successful uh, like degrees of freedom say, like yeah like more things can happen and i can still send mm-hmm. you yeah. know it's like if if i don't hit that hold perfectly or like mm-hmm. i like kind of move a little wrong going to something that doesn't completely derail what's happening it's like oh i've been there before mm-hmm. i know how to like re-manipulate what's happening to turn back into a successful outcome rather than like kind of balancing on this knife edge. And if anything goes wrong, I've just tipped completely off and, and now I'm back on the ground or I'm hanging on the rope or whatever it is. Um, Lawrence Acefo, a, a, another friend of ours and coach who we talk with a lot, uh, introduced at least me to the this concept of affordances, um, which I think is essentially what you're saying with uh, degrees of freedom. But the more affordances you have, the more movements that you have open to you to create a successful outcome, the easier it is to actually have a successful outcome as opposed to just like relying really heavily on a very narrow set of opportunities. Mm. Man, you're, that was really fascinating. That actually captures, I think, part of what I was trying to talk about much earlier in the conversation when I was saying that like, you know, I, I've, I've grown so much as a climber in my own last six years, despite having not gone up the grades very much. 
I have way more of that. Like that's what I've experienced is that, you know, I used to be able to climb at my current limit or close to my current limit if everything aligned perfectly, but I had like no margin outside of that. And now I just feel like I can enjoy my whole world of climbing so much more because conditions don't have to be as perfect. I can do things a lot faster because I don't have to have them, you know, perfectly refined. Um, I can climb a lot more different styles and things. And it, it, yeah, I just, I just have so things can go wrong. I can still get up the climb and feel good about it. Like I can make all those little micro adjustments halfway through a move. If I don't catch a hold correctly. Um, I expect that eventually that will all lead towards, you know, higher peak performances. Um, but it just, it just feels a lot better to be able to climb that way and, and not have to have the perfect try to be able to get on top of stuff. Like that's, it's really nice. And it makes you feel like a better athlete. It just makes you feel like a much better climber. Cause you are a better athlete. And yeah. yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think that's, when that's we cool. were like beating around this idea, when we first were writing this stuff for the podcast, and we talked about this like internal feeling thing. I, I stopped. Well, and I was like, well, that's like how I define athleticism. Mm. Right. Like it, if you can't do yeah. that at all, your chances of being a good athlete in whatever endeavor is like pretty low in my opinion. So I, I think that like you saying, like you feel like a better athlete is like, you, yeah, it's cause you are, mm. you, you are better by every metric. Yeah. Now I have like better language for it. Yeah. That's the affordability thing. That's really interesting. Yeah. Thanks Lawrence. Coach Lawrence in uh, new England. <laughs> yeah. Is he coaching for the a school team? Is it brandy? He, uh, he works for, is he not doing that anymore? um, What's the big chain of gyms in New England? I'm totally blanking here. Central Rock. C Central Rock? Okay. Central Rock cool. and runs their uh, CCS programs. Yep. If yeah, you're in the New England do. area, go hang out with Lawrence. He's the man. <laughs> Where are we at? Are we... Uh, uh, are we? Well, I, I was just about to say, I think we've, we've handled a lot of the advanced climber as far as... Or at least I think as far as like the climbing portion of it is concerned do y'all agree or do we want to touch any more on that i think we're good okay cool um yeah the i think that kind of leaves sort of our our last remaining point and then i think we can sort of sum it up and wrap it up um like what role does the like non-climbing off the wall physical preparedness training like wh what does that look like for an advanced climber, we've talked about it a little bit um, already. I think kind of as we've addressed some of these other things, um, but this is a this is a thing that uh, um, just another thing that that uh, Matt and I have been talking about recently. Um, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. I think that's that's like a, a thing of critical importance. Like you know, we talked about this kind of optimization problem and like kind of getting distracted by certain things or thinking that like there's some new special way out there to do it that's going to to get me like the kind of gains that maybe I was feeling earlier on in my career. It's really not about that. It's more about almost doubling down on the stuff that you know works mm. and honing the like programming and application of that. And I think that's a... a that's something I want to kick, kick to, to Max. I feel like this is this is an area I've been learning a lot from him on recently. Mm. Uh, yeah, no pressure, Matt. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, that's good. Uh, I, it's true. I mean, it's definitely a pet peeve of mine as well. But like, so I just got off the phone with a, an athlete that I'm working with who is real strong, real, real, real strong by whatever metric you come up with. And he felt like, cool, I just accomplished all these goals. I'm climbing the whatever now, which is like a long-term goal for this athlete. What's next? Like, what's the, I, I feel like I just leveled up. What's the next thing? And I was like, you're, you're doing it right. Like there, there isn't a magic bean thing here. Uh, and the analogy I give is Usain Bolt where dude's the fastest man to ever walk the planet. There's no magic 
version of sprinting that he starts doing after he wins an Olympic gold. Like all the things that he did to get there, he continues to do. And the same principles that you learn from the first time you start training still apply no matter how good you get. If you are a trainer, you're familiar with the said principle, which is specific adaptations to impose demands or progressive overload, like two really basic foundational principles of being a trainer. You still use those things until you decide that you don't want to get better anymore. And there, there's no magic sauce there. There's no Instagram workout that you don't know about that's going to all of a sudden change these things. It's just fine tuning the things you're doing, right? So when Usain Bolt is running sprints, at some point he started running with a parachute or a sled behind him with some weight. And maybe he adds the parachute gets bigger and maybe there's a little more weight on it. But he's not not sprinting at any point in the progression. And I think that's really what this comes down to is like you, you never level up to the point where you're ready for like all these new things. And it comes back to our maybe our tool conversation way early on in the conversation in what feels like maybe yesterday, if you've hung on this long for our talk. Uh, but, <laughs> you know, like some of those things that maybe you passed on earlier, you can pull out from that box that you described, Stephen, of like, let me put this aside for later. But other than that, like you're doing the same stuff over and over again because it got you here. It's the only way forward. There isn't a magic thing, so stop looking for it. Um, yeah, I know that seems silly and maybe a little preachy, but I, I would say like 90% of the athletes that I encounter of any grade range, but particularly the advanced ones feel like, cool, I've covered a lot of ground and they put in a lot of hard work to get where they're at. I'm not trying to take that away from them, but the hard work is going to continue to be what moves you forward. There isn't a, a thing you're missing. Yeah. To me, that's relaxing to hear like that. You're not missing anything keep doing the stuff you're good at. It's going to work. Yeah. I mean, I think this is a good chance actually to clarify something from our last conversation. Will, I had someone reach out to me on Instagram. Can't remember who it was. I, I forgot to write down their question here. Um, cause I kind of answered it for them, but I wanted to bring it up today. Um, it fits right in here. So someone reached out after our last episode, Will, and, and, um, asked, you know, you guys, I'm confused because it sounds like you were saying two things that were contradictory. You were saying, don't copy the pros. Don't do what Adam Andra does. That doesn't make any sense. But then you're also saying, we're all just meat and bones. We're all skeletons. Like we all kind of have the same raw ingredients as, as organisms. And like, we need the same types of stimulus and stuff. And he's like, I don't really get how to hold both of those things. Um, but it's, it, it to me, it's, and I, I want you to speak to it too, but it, to me, it's what you guys are talking about right now, which is like, we have the tools that we have as climbers. We have things that work. There's maybe going to be some new interventions and stuff as the sport grows, but like, we know that hangboarding helps. We know that doing some weightlifting can help. We know that spending time on different types of bouldering, you know, terrain and stuff can all be really helpful. We're all using the same tools. You can definitely take an exercise from a pro that is going to serve you towards your goal and scale it to your ability. Um, that makes sense. That absolutely makes sense. And it'll make sense for you to continue with that exercise or tool as you progress as a climber and iterate on it in a way that helps you move towards your new goal um, over time if it's continuing to work for you. Like that makes sense too. So the, the difference there is that we're not just copying, pasting, like I'm gonna train exactly like Adam Andre six days a week um, when I'm a beginner climber because that, that, that makes no sense. Like, you know, you need different things. That's mm -hmm. what this whole conversation has been about. Like there's different focus areas for you at that stage in your climber, at, 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 in your climbing versus, you know, someone who's been doing it for 25 years and is literally an Olympian. Um, so I, I kind of spelled all that out and hopefully that was helpful for that person. But I wonder if you have anything um, to add as far as that goes, like helping people make sense of like, when should I not copy a pro? When, sh when is it appropriate to take specific inspiring ideas from people and scale them to where I'm at? Yeah. So I think what I'm going to do is kind of combine what Matt just said with uh, something from the very beginning of what we were talking about. We were talking about uh, tools 
changing over time and, and the opportunity to misuse a tool. Um, and Matt gave the anecdote about the kind of Paul Robinson hangboard pull up thing. And what Matt said is that like the, it wasn't that that exercise was good or bad, but it represented a different kind of stimulus for a Paul Robinson than it would like represent for Matt Jones at that time. Right. So it, doing pull-ups on crimps, like that's, that's an ex, that's a tool. Like then depending on your goal and whatever, like that could be useful, but doing it exactly how Paul was doing it for Matt, all of a sudden max effort day where for Paul, totally like middle zone, mm -hmm. just kind of maintenance stuff. And so I think that's really where the, the difference starts being important. Um, cause it is all the same thing. Like we are all bodies, skeletons, muscles, like the said principle is a said principle, progressive overload is progressive overload. Those things don't change, but the capacity of an athlete does change over time. And so different things represent different things for different athletes at different times. So you could look at Adam Andra and if you like really looked at his training nuance, you'd be like, oh, what's Adam's goal? And we know that Adam's goal is doing something. And we're like, wow, the training that he's doing is all these things that hit these different parts of Adam so that he can climb this route or whatever, prepare himself for some challenge. And if we're able to look at it that on that nuanced level, we can take the same process that Adam's using. We could take some of those exercises maybe that he's using. We could use the way that he's structuring it, but we would have to scale it and be like, okay, well, I have this goal. So these things maybe aren't going to apply as much to me. Like I've, I have this level of capacity as an athlete, so I probably can't like train in this way, six days a week. Um, like what I'm watching Adam do looks really hard to me, but it might not be that hard for him. Mm. And so understanding that like maybe what looks really hard is actually a maintenance level for him. And so I'm misinterpreting a maintenance level, like a maintenance day for a professional climber for a hard day. And then, and then I misapply that to myself. So I think that's, that's where that's like the, the mismatch happens. Yeah. Very well said. That was great. All right. Um, do we have any loose strings to tie up as far as advanced, um, anything from our original outline, the beginner, intermediate, advanced, did we touch on, uh, strong, not good and good, not strong for advanced. And do we feel ready to wrap this up? I feel good for a wrap up, Matt. Likewise. All right. Yeah. Cool. This has been incredible. Very, very dense. I'm sure, um, I'm sure you guys, uh, are going to benefit from going back through some of that again. Once again, I will try to break this down in a way that makes the most possible sense and put um, little notes and timestamps in the show notes for this episode. So if you want to go back and revisit anything, I will definitely break out where we started talking about beginner, intermediate, advanced, and, um, and I'll add some keywords to kind of clue in on different subjects that we talked about within each of those. So yeah, go check that out at thenuggetclimbing.com. I will link to um, both of these guys where you can find them and follow them, Matt Jones and Will Anglin and what they are up to. Thank you both for doing this. This was um, a lot of preparation on your parts before I even stepped in here. I really appreciate you doing that. It made my job very easy today. It was very fun. And uh, this has been a, like a nugget filled masterclass for, for folks. And um, I think a lot of people will probably get a lot out of this. So appreciate you both. We've got a ton of listener questions that I think we're going to dive into. Maybe we'll take a little break if needed, but Patrons, stick around. We're going to be doing that next, and uh, we'll put that out as an extra. Um, yeah, anything else before we wrap this up? Thanks for letting us nerd it out. <laughs> yeah, we, we appreciate the free reign, man. Thank you for having us. Of course. Very fun for me. Very fun for me. And um, yeah, I appreciate you both. It'd be fun to do this again if there's another topic or a series of topics that's, you know, 
um, that you guys find yourself talking about between yourselves and and going back and forth about it it's always fun to have you both on or it's fun to have you on will and it's it's great to meet you matt and great to have you on for the first time and we should all do this again it's been it's been a blast definitely thank you all right thanks for listening everybody we'll see you next time